Um, all right. So today I have a few things to show you, and then we can jump into the uh, into the going over any images and jewelry that you want to talk about. Um, so let me get to my usual array of notes and so on. And I can now officially announce that, yes, as Wendy predicted, the class that I'm teaching, uh, Live Hollow Forms, is going to be at Diane Weimer's um, workshop. Um, so that is coming up live three days at Diane's studio in uh, just outside of L.A. in California. Um, and that is in March of next year. She has a really lovely studio in a beautiful location, and it's a, usually a super cheerful bunch of people. Um, and so if you haven't been there, it's a nice visit, and there's easy to get to local hotels and incredible food. Um, and so that will be next year's Hollow Form Workshop. I'm not sure if I'll also teach a virtual version of it. Um, coming up this year, as before, we still have the Clasps class, which is in November, and the Bezels Less Ordinary class, which is in September. I already have folks registered for Clasps. I don't think I actually have anybody for the Bezels Less Ordinary. So if we don't get some traction on that soon, I may not run that this year after all, but we'll see. Um, the Clasps is one of my favorite to teach. Second, it'd be a tie between Clasps and Hollow Forms because I really... I'm getting my jam on with clasps. Um, right now, the clasps, there's always going to be a box clasp in that, but anybody who's already done box clasps can do something more advanced. There's a slew in that particular workshop of um, our first days usually spent a bunch of wire-based and simple clasps that you can elevate with the techniques that I show you. So making fancier than normal hook clasps and toggle clasps. Um, and depending on people's interest, I usually throw in a couple of really special ones um, just for some interesting technology. And then uh, the third big clasp that we do in any given cycle on that, I always have to decide between things like the hinge-based clasp or uh, a um, toggle, I mean, a um, keyhole clasp. Um, and since I happen to be working on a keyhole clasp for a project, I figured I'd show you guys what that is all about right now, just so you can get a little visual and I gotta zoom in and then I've got to spotlight myself for you briefly. There we go. So this is a lot of times a toggle clasp is gonna be round because it's easier to line up, but I figured I needed a little more challenge. Oh, I gotta stay in screen. Where am I going? There's my mark. Um, and so this is actually a double hollow form, a stacked hollow form, and it has a paired keyhole set. Um, so obviously it's not finished and neatened up, but <clears throat> it has a spot that it fits and it should fit only one way. Then you rotate it a turn and it becomes one of the more solid class. This is hard for it to come loose if you've done it right. There are a couple of really nuanced little tricks to making sure that it's solid and it won't come undone of its own accord. Um, but this is a super cool and much harder than it should be clasp mechanism. That's one of my favorites. Um, in this case, it's going to end up with some chain links to give it a little bit of flexibility. And it's going in the midst of this multi-part two-directional hollow form, you know, reversible hollow form and chain necklace that I'm working on. So these all have their concave versions, as well as their convex, or as well as their flat version. So it's going to be fully reversible. Um, and this is going to be the centerpiece clasp that is going to be hollow. I mean, it's going to be mokume from either side so that it integrates in and puts the theme of the mokume coming through it. Um, so those are the, that's, I'm probably going to go with that clasp because I haven't taught that one as my third in a while. Um, but I'm, I'm still debating. I'm still debating if anybody who's signed up for that class already has strong feelings of that versus a hinge based class, you're welcome to drop me a note. You may recognize this beast. I always suppose I should come back in. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. I'm hoping that one's going to be a nice piece. So that hollow form piece that I just showed you is part of, um, I'm, I got filmed one of the shows that I've done in the Pacific Northwest got a really cool grant to do um, some short form video. And so they've hired a videographer to come and meet with certain artists. And I got, 
I got followed around for a day as I started this project and they filmed a lot of the details of it and then did an interview with me and so on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of it. It's, it's like six hours of talking and work and stuff to get uh, what's probably gonna be a five minute video. All right, so you may recognize this behemoth that we worked on in wax. Um, I got it back from my friend Thomas. Thanks to Thomas for, for casting this for me. Um, and it is in some rough shape. It's not in terrible shape, but it's no fault of the caster. It's the fault of my carving and um, the nature of the beast when you're doing a one-off. So this was not molded. So it worked from the wax that, he, that, he, that I gave him, literally the wax that you guys watched me carve. And what happens when you get it back is there's going to be sprue points and he very kindly made sure that he was putting my sprue points in places that wouldn't interfere with the nominal pattern that I carved. Um, and so these will need to get cut away and cleaned up. And then I also have, um, and this is probably, I probably can't get close enough for you guys to really see, but you'll be able to maybe, let me see if there's any spots, see if I can get zoomed in super, super tight for you. Focus, come on. Almost up. Oh, there we go. So you see a little bit of sort of dottiness around the not shiny parts of the metal. The shiny parts are starting to get taken away, but there's some little bits um, where air bubbles get into the into the mix, little pockets where the metal doesn't fall. And so before I actually set, I need to do a, a little bit of a job of pounding those down. Um, and uh, I do that with a beater tool, a beater, B-E-A-T-E-R tool, but I cannot for the life of, my, of me find either of the two designs that I have of that. So I may end up having to make another one if I can't find it. Um, but basically what, we, what we're doing is um, burnishing the metal around the, the points in the, um, uh, I'm completely at loss for word. I have been on Zoom calls for about eight and a half of my last nine hours. Um, so we need, I'll need to basically hard burnish any of the bubbles that have come up in the casting. And they're tiny. There's this porosity. That's the word that was escaping me. There's a little bit of porosity in this cast. And so I'm going to want to clean that up because otherwise it'll start to wear at those points and show up looking sort of like breaks in the metal. Um, and then the other thing is that it had a little bit more shrinkage than anticipated. So my stone doesn't fully fit comfortably in there. That's not surprising. We knew that that was a, a risk when we're doing this kind of a, a piece. So as part of when we do get to setting it, um, I will be cleaning out the line a little bit with burrs. But that is very common when you're casting to a specific stone, that you have some cleanup. You'd rather err on the side of too small than on uh, of too big. Um, and so well, this will be in a later session because I have to find that beater tool and do a whole bunch of really boring, it's literally just going thunk, 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 thunk. You may have seen one of them. They look like a little um, a little wheel with ball bearings all around them is one form of beater tool. And the ball bearings just kind of thump against as they, as they spin, they thump against this. Or a, a handmade one um, could be, like I was taught early on to use an old drill bit and put a little U-hook in them. That kind is particularly terrifying because you're working with a burr that is off-center on purpose. And so it's going flap, flap, flap on each pass. Um, I, I It was the way I was taught, but I hate it, frankly. So that's why I really would like to find my... Um, ball bearing one. Um, and there's a few different styles of those, but all they are really is something that's harder steel and that pushes gently but firmly against the material, acting as a kind of a burnisher slash squisher around the porosity holes, right? Um, so we're going to, I'm going to do a bunch of that offline um, and then I'll save the final fitting of the stone and everything. And then we will actually do that Roman setting on a future, that's the hammer set. So I'll use my um, Fordham hammer uh, micro motor, uh, and maybe I'll try. I'll, maybe I'll start it with by hand tools, but I know that I do not have the hand strength to get that fully set without using my um, my motorized tools. Um, the Romans can keep that part of it. <laughs> um, so that's where we got on those and the pearls and the setting that we did last time. We're going to test. I have not touched these myself. 
since we did them. So I got to make sure that they are actually well set. I cannot pull our first model off. This was the peg in cup. I cannot pull my second one off. That was the flat surface. And I better not be able to pull the one that I did the freaking little um, shim inside of. Yeah, those are all nice and solidly set. So we got three different varieties of pearls last time. And we did our little, um, in my case, square stone set in the faux channel setting. And I realized the other thing I didn't manage to do is go back and redo the tension set that I did last time that I had intended to. So I will have that for you another time as well. Um, or we'll make it one of the redos because I want to, honestly, I want to challenge myself, especially after some of the photos I found that I'll be showing today. I want to challenge myself to do a tension set with a trillion, um, with a two, uh, you know, one side, the long side and one side, the point side of a trillion. Um, so I may do that on screen for you guys, um, even though Don doesn't have any trillion cuts in his book, which I find odd. Um, so that's what we got from the last round. Any questions on any of those before we jump into other things? Okay. And I really need to find a window of time to properly finish the board as we get the rest of these done. So I don't have any making anymore. So we're going to jump into I, the Wendy's wonderful idea of let's talk about some of the images in the book, about some of the um, other kinds of things that you've found in your own practice or that you've seen other people do. Um, what I've done is I've pulled some of the harder to identify settings. I, I kind of skipped over anything that was pretty clearly a basic step bezel or, you know, the ones that we could all go, oh yeah, that's that. That's how they did it. Um, I kind of skipped over those. Um, but instead, I've just pulled out a series of the images that had some more unusual settings, in my opinion, that would have had some challenges. Are you guys all seeing the gold ring? Yes. Um, so I don't know. This should be a round robin, like, you know, thoughts, questions, opinions. Where do you see the challenges? I can make this a little bigger. Any ideas on this one? Because there's a few different settings in here. I just saw that in the book. What page do you, did you write down the page numbers? I those? did not because I had to, in order to get the scans of them, I had to take it from the electronic copy, which doesn't stay paginated. This was one of, I started it early on. So this is oh, page nine in the, in the book. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I'm seeing, this looks like a fairly traditional upside down square bezel set got a little bit funky expansion. So there's it looks a little bit intentionally off center. It looks like maybe there's glass or opal set below. It actually does it have a description. Amethyst, tourmaline, boulder opal. So it is boulder opal. This is what captivates me is that feels like there's some kind of fold over. Like I see hingeness here. I don't know whether this ring opens up. Um, this pearl looks like it's uh, rivet set as a full bead through. This looks like sort of more like what we were doing when we were doing the um, bullet setting. It's just an unusual cut. But what's captivating me is this part that feels like maybe these flip up kind of like, a, I hate to say it, but kind of like a toilet seat lid, it feels like. And that mm -hmm. possibly it's just hiding a fairly traditional walled bezel for the um, for the opal, it just looks so much more unusual and intriguing than that because it feels like there's some pivot action going on here around those hinges. I don't know. Anybody have other thoughts on this one? Yeah, for sure. It definitely looks like what you said because <laughs> you can see on the other end it's open, so it's got to slide up somehow where the here right or is. this part. Right to uh, the hinges where the, the pearl end. is, right? I think there. so. If it is in fact hinged, that may just be rivet. But then it's it hard. looks like it's open like a V for you to be able to flip it up. 
Yeah, like it's a catch point here. This oh, mm -hmm. I wonder if this is a bracelet and not a ring. This, oh, it's a commitment ring, it says. Okay, so it's not grand scale that you're trying to get it over a wrist. Um I would I would have loved to be able to see this piece up close or have another another angle shot on it. Yeah, but what's captivating me is like this looks like a catch built into it of some kind. So almost it has an unfinished look to it. <laughs> it well, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, it's ha it has a rustic look for sure. It actually yeah. looks to me like it's been very intentionally finished to this style. You don't set a pearl in the middle of a gold ring without having it pretty darn well finished before the pearl goes in. Right. Um, I can't. I can't imagine that cleaning this ring is a delight. Um, and I no, see that it, it's it's forged from yeah. the shank from yeah. the thick to thin. Yep. And it, the photo is deceiving because where that boulder opal is, you know, it's hard to know if that was flat. I, I'm looking at it thinking now it's flat. But when I first look at it, it looked like it was kind of flipped up in the back. Oh, yeah. Like it might be not a flat top, but might be... Uh, an uh, uh, abstract shape back here. Yeah, or set from behind. So I first thought it was set from behind, but the more that I look at it, the more I <clears> think <throat> this along here, it like if we were to flip this whole piece out of the way, the more I think it might actually just be a traditional walled bezel. And this happens to make it look more intriguing by putting an overlayer on it, which I find really interesting as an approach because opals in particular are so soft, you want to put something large around them sometimes. You can't just bump it up against and push down. So this is kind of an intriguing, like it really does look to me like that piece, at least, if not this little add-on, is, is a layer resting above the setting. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Because I don't know if it's if it isn't, then I don't know. Like this opal appears to be going further under this gold. And this is yeah. mighty thick gold. I don't know how you get that push down where you need it without, I don't know. It's, it's so, one of the really intriguing things about the variety in this is the different types of material that's being set, how they demand different um, approaches, right? You know, it's not all one type of setting in the ring, and it creates challenges, order of operations, which stones would I sit, set first and last? You know, is it is it requisite to have set the, this pearl before I set this, or can I, can I do the pearl last, which would be my normal inclination, so that I don't have any other things risking scratching it, but then it's battling the opal is also something that I would normally do last. Um... I don't know. There's some cool challenges in this one. Any other thoughts or questions on this one? It looks like it is cut right where the pearl is. Do you see that seam line up there? Yeah. Which yeah. may be an indicator of it going on top of that boulder opal. Yep. Meaning resting above it instead of actually yeah. pushed down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's possible that this was built with the wall attached and lifted up and all they were doing was forcing it down to a float position with a hammer set or something like that. Um, but it sort of seems contraindicated by what might be hinges. I wish we had a... Like those might be tabs and that that top piece that's going, oh, let's say it's going over that boulder opal is just extended on the two sides of that pearl then extended out to that bullet is that one continuous piece yeah it feels like from here through that part of the what i'm yeah. calling the hinge but may just be like this it's a little unclear to me whether that is a piece of this or a piece of this or both like this could actually be two different colors of gold from the look of it. It could be a yellow mm -hmm. gold framed with a red gold. And then it goes it's back a, to yellow gold. Hmm. We just don't it's have a, a good real juxtaposition because the the part you put your finger through, you know, yeah. the shank, I guess, is elegant. Yep. And then the top half 
it's just an interesting mix of uh, processes, isn't it? Yeah, I like the, you're right. They've done such a clean job of their lines down here. And I really like the, um, but then it transitions to sort of a modern version Indian. of what might have been old styles of construction. So it gives that blend of periods almost. Okay, should we move on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So here's one that I find, uh, I am not sure how these beads have been set. That's page 10, by the way. Oh, thank you. Page 10, yes. So citrine, which doesn't particularly take heat, so it's not easy to solder, but we also may just not have a good angle. It's possible that buried under here is a nice rivet. Um, or maybe there's a that's the base and it rivets up here in the jump ring. That'd be a little harder to access. Um, otherwise, it feels like a pretty traditional um, uh, tube set and bezel set. Anybody have thoughts on this one? Well, I thought those were beads. I think they are, but how do we get them on? What, so this is soldered. This looks soldered. What's go, what is what is the connection point? And so the only thing I can guess, because I don't think citrine will take the heat unless they're doing something that's magical, is that they've maybe got it riveted underneath this point. Yeah, tap and die, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I was going to say die. tap and die. Oh, yeah. duh. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. need to do more with tap and die. I never think a screw as a mechanism to connect things. That is exactly, I bet, what they did. Yeah, it's neat looking, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Nice. That's a great answer for how you could go about doing that. This one is the following page, page 11. And... I'm guessing from the weight of this material that it is tension set plus maybe these upper corners are getting pushed down a little bit more than is obvious in this photograph. But mostly this is such heavy material that I suspect it was open the, the W wide, put the stone in, push it back in, probably with a little cut in like we do for a, a traditional tension setting. Um, but boy, I like the construction of, like this is probably mm -hmm. in cast components, but it doesn't look like it's all one cast to me. Thoughts? No, it looks like two. And then they, yeah. And then they put the rings together or else they made it look like they did by yeah. the scene. Yep, <laughs> like it might be a wedding set that you 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 have a plain ring until you have the pieces put together. It almost looks like a jigsaw puzzle. Like this unit yes. is a later addition into one and two rings. Definitely a puzzle. <laughs> it's a cool piece. Any other questions or thoughts on that one? Heck of a stone. <laughs> this quartz. one... You know, I meant to put the artist's name on this one. Oh, this is Bruce Anderson, Sterling and Tourmalin. And I think it's a combination of prong and uh, it may just be a, a prong that he only has the two prongs on, but it feels like there's a little bit of a, a wall frame here that he's built coming in behind. So fairly straightforward, but a really elegant presentation of the stone itself and the relative lines that he's created, verticals, mm -hmm. horizontals, repeating of the shape in the cutaway and blackened, and then interjecting some curves to create that movement. Yeah, the bottom curve reminds me of an Asian piece. Yeah. Where, yeah. where the square is on the bottom. Yep, hints of that. Um, but it's intriguing how much blank space he built into this piece. Um, and I like that the the dichotomy of the gold on top of the silver, the silver, and then the gold. Like this, see, this feels like some very intentional choices 
about the line construction. The curiosity to me is why silver here? It could have just been a cost saving measure um, or it could have been intentional. Like I see that I'm betting that the silver shows more interestingly in that back frame. But it looks like there's sort of a wall frame, a crossover maybe holding the prongs. And then the connection is to that bar, uh, to that bar and to that top edge. And the rest is mostly decorative, although this looks like it may be solder point there. How do you think they made the black? I don't know. I can't tell whether it is an inset. Like, is this a hollow form? If we could see it on its side, it looks like maybe it's a very narrow hollow form. And this is the background level and it's just black in the interior. It could be an enamel. Does he say anything about enamel? No, no. Um, it looks in, in the photograph, I would have said this was four or five inches tall, but it's reported as being two and a half inches. So this is actually a fairly small stone, relatively speaking. Um, I, I use Goceba for that kind of background blackening. That's my go-to for black the nice black. darkness. You like black max? Yeah. Black Jack? No, or no, black no. I, I like black black. Is ah, where yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Hit too hard. Let's go back. Sonia's asking who the artist is. On the last one, that is yeah. Bruce Anderson. Photo by Ralph Gabriner, who did some of my early photographs. The bummer that he's not doing a whole heck of a lot of jewelry photography these days. Um, this one is page, where did I go to? Jumped ahead because we had a, oh, this is, this is page 22. Okay. Um, there it is. Sorry, say again. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, there it is. Yep. And it's Mary Ann Petrick, Sterling Bicolored Tourmaline. This one is four and a half inches tall. So this is a nice long pendant. Looks like a hand uh, um, woven or crocheted chain. It looks more like crochet to me. Um. And I like that it also looks like it's a locket. I wish we had an open shot of it. I always love mm, seeing lockets. Um, looks like Great it's text. burlap texture. Rolling mill with burlap. But it's a somewhat non-traditional. Yeah, I really like that. Say again. What was that? I, think I don't know who really spoke, like but it. I like the texture. It yeah. really does a lot. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the, the textures that squish in different ways than you expect. I really like that texture. Um, one of my favorite textures I can't make anymore. Rio Grande used to ship their sheet metal in, um, in those corrugated, glued-together sheets. That we would get. Um, the It was corrugated on the inside and then they auto glued around the metal so it kept it from moving around in shipping. Um, once those are used to store metal, they make an incredible fabric texture down in the rolling mill, but you only get one use out of them. And when I was at Rio, I, I told somebody that and they were like, here, we'll give you a couple yards of our packing material. I took it home if it hasn't transported the metal already and for whatever reason become the distorted, broken down thing, it doesn't give the same cool effect. And then they stop using that packing material. So I was saving my last little scrap of it for as long as I could. Um, but the burlap is another great alternative. Or if you're like me and you, um, you know, you get your tomatoes and potatoes in the mesh bags, those make really lovely, um, lovely patterns as well. Uh, but what I really like about it is how they embraced the edge of the fabric on this. Um, what's interesting to me about the setting is that this is a tab slash prong setting. Yeah. I, I think this was probably built out of flat sheet and folded up. There may be a slight crease point, like you might have the way that we do cornering where we're soldering to strengthen once we've um, sawed and filed up an angle to fold. I wouldn't be surprised if they did that along these, at least the bigger ones. Maybe the little guys didn't need it as much, um, but they become the prongs in the frame. Um, 
So it's it's a, one of the more interesting tab settings that I've seen. Questions, thoughts on this one? I, you know, I wonder how John picked this one. What was the story behind it that he chose this one? What <laughs> so I thought I'd told you guys the story. You, about you did. You did. I'm I'm not sure he picked this one. I don't know. I don't know whether it was a hey, here are the pictures we have. Um, but it's a cool setting. It's just not a setting that I think he demonstrated in the book. It's not a yeah. he doesn't do tab settings in the book. So um yeah. Uh he, he also only talks about bead setting. Um, and, and you guys have solved for me the likely, the most likely way of doing this, which is that these are little nuts on the ends of this. I should have <laughs> gone for that. I don't, I can't believe I didn't think about it. That's exactly what I would do now if I were looking at these. Um, and there's just a couple of like variant decorative elements that don't look like they're actually supporting it. But this one in the back is kind of cool. It looks like they've built a frame and used the bead quality in a way that like this to me is more interesting than this that looks like a cake sitting there to me but these ones that have the wall-to-wall -wall frames and like like i love the stones i love the cut of these um but the the setting is more intriguing to me on its side for some reason and i don't know why page nice. 30 by the way pardon page 31 page 31 thank you I love any other these. thoughts on this one I love these. I have some really cool beats that I think I can, but I don't know. Can't figure this out. Get yourself a tap and die set and start practicing making um, tiny little screws and tiny little uh, nuts and bolt, you know, nuts and bolt base pieces, basically. You know, one side you can solder, the other side, um, you then have to make your tap and die. And then the final thing that you do on something like that is you put a Tiny, tiny drop of super glue once you're confident you're all polished up and your setting is where you want it to be so that it doesn't ever loosen off of the off of the screw point and if, uh, i was thinking if you don't like the look of a screw and you had <laughs> i don't know how you do this it'd have to be a pretty large stone you could uh create a cylinder and then set the tap and die uh screw part inside it because i don't know if i'd love the look through a transparent stone of a screw so when you say set a cylinder do you mean like a, a tube yes so instead of a rod you'd have a whole tube running through well i'm just saying that the look of a screw wouldn't be as pretty down the cylinder you know down well, the, oh, the hole. you don't have to gotcha, gotcha, you don't gotcha. have no, to serrate not, it all the way down yeah i'm talking about just oh the that's a, the that's end. true yeah, yeah yeah that's true yeah Although you do get, you get some super interesting things once you start threading outside and inside of tubing. So you uh -huh. could use, ostensibly, you could use a tube as your runner down the center, tap and die the outside of the tube and make that your screw for the, for the catch point nut, but then flush set something into the top of the tube. So it's that's a type probably of stone what they did stone. I don't see any hint of any screws at all. So they did a nice job. Yeah, I'm betting just this stretch right from here to here is where the screw is. But I'm talking about going a step further. They used rod. I'm wondering what it would be like to do heavy walled tubing instead of rod, flush set a stone on right. the end, and then tap and die That'd be beautiful. outside. Um, so you get a stone in stone effect. We expect that from you next time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that my I don't know my tap and die set goes big enough. I have a really I have a watchmaker's tap and die set, um, so I'll have to see if I have the right combo. Um, you have a, you have a month to order it. That's oh, okay. Yeah, plenty, plenty. I'm not going to be at my studio weeks. for a month and a half of. I mean, three three weeks I, of that. I but looked at um at my looked at which? tools because I did an order. Yeah, but I didn't know what to order. They had a whole bunch of them. Yeah, so um, Micromark has some great sets for tap and die for small scale, but honestly, the best places I've ever seen them is going shopping in ant in junk stores, and you know, especially if you're on the East Coast, man, go up to Liberty Tools in uh, in Liberty, Maine. Um, bring your hard hat, bring a day's worth of energy, um, and and just go hunting through the old tools. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, I would go to like a, um, uh, Micromark or I bet that, um, 
oh, the place that we get our wire and springs and things like that. Uh, Micromark, micro tools and Micromark. Uh, micro tools and Micromark, but there's um there's another place that sells like the right kinds of steel and. I bought yeah. one from Instagram. Oh yeah? yeah, yeah. I I have to find out the name the name of the person. I I will write it in the in the chat. That sure. Sonia, yeah, so I thought. I thought that you and I took that tap and die a month and a half ago. Did you take the tap and die class from Metalworks? No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I didn't have time. I just got back. I didn't have time for anything. But I put the name. I put the name now. Awesome. Thank you. The other thing uh, is tap and dies. Remember that they come in two um, two types. There's the uh, metric and the um, Americanized inches. Standard. Standard, thank you. Um, and so you want to make sure that you either have both or you have the one that you're likely to use most in whatever you're working on. Um, I would personally, if I had to pick only one, I'd probably go with the um, the one that's in millimeters. Um, okay, so this piece, Harold O'Connor, who I think is actually, is he still around and teaching? I think he may still occasionally show up at conventions, conferences and stuff. Um, but wow. Harold is teaching some online classes at George, with Georgia Metalsmiths. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So he is still around and teaching. That's good to know. So first of all, super gorgeous piece of opal. Oh, spectrolite, not opal. Super gorgeous piece of spectrolite. But then, wow. Uh, what is that? So, <laughs> so much to unpack. Um, I suspect the stone is truly being held by, I'm betting there's a piece of metal that goes between these two as well probably really only being held by these three points of the the v plus the uppercase but wow the addition of a pass through tube of gold wire of gold it creates a tension to the stone um while also creating a flexibility to the piece like this is just cool structural construction so many neat things about this do you um, think well, those are, are spec, um, what's the word? Speculum? Speculum. Yeah, speculum. Yeah, think, they must be. That would be so expensive if they were solid, yeah. Yeah, although it could be that he, so it's a little unclear to me whether this is uh, gold. It might be gold, um, you know, bimetal, because oh, nobody yeah. can see the interior. Um, or it could be plated or fused, you know, I mean, or... or um, the thing that's heavier than plated. Wow, gang, my words are so gone today. <laughs> Verse, um, vermil. Vermil. Verme, yeah, thank you. Verme. Verme. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but it would surprise me. I I wouldn't, it, I mean, first of all, probably this piece is old enough that gold wasn't the crazy prices that we've been dealing with. Um, but also it just looks like it, it has the luster of full 18 karat. Um, and the, this is one of my favorite little pieces of this both how he positioned it in the design of the stone and that's such a tiny element like my eye goes there on this piece it's yeah. got movement because of the lines that he's built around it but it also sparks even though it's the tiniest little smidge of gold in there for all we know it's silver tubing below it and just gold at the top that we can see um it's you know without asking him it could be you know, we don't know what it was constructed by, but think about the modifications you can do to a stone and to a setting that just bring it to life. Can you enlarge that, Rachel? Yep. Just you like I don't you know that it's still the quality of the PDF that or the Kindle. You know, the, that's the best I'm going to get because we don't have yeah good quality. Oh, image. good. So it's a wire wrap. I couldn't tell if that was solid or wrap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This part I think is wire wrap, and I think it looks like he may have actually done a braid. Yeah, that looks like a braid. And then wire wrap at the other end. Um, so I don't know whether he like wrapped and tucked things, wrapped and soldered things with the stone in there. I imagine this was probably one of the last setting steps that he had to do. Maybe he soldered one end on preparing it for running through. So it has some, you know, we're not going to lose that if it comes loose on the other end. I don't know. Um, and I also don't know how this is... This is a brooch. I don't know where the pin is hidden. I think it's probably, I would guess, back there. here. Yeah. 
but it's, is it following a curve? There's not even a hint of it in the photograph shadow. So maybe it was taken out. Um, yeah, it's a, just a stunning, unusual setting to me. You can ask him. He said to email him. You oh, can... yeah. Okay. We'll we'll talk about it with him and see if we can figure out what he did. He's so... a new hero. He never polishes. So now I'm never going <laughs> to polish pieces again. <laughs> Good to know. I have yet to take a class with him. I'm looking forward to trying to see what he's got available. Um, That's on 36. 36. Thank you for keeping keeping me honest here, gang. Um, but I, I can't tell every... is... Is what I can't tell is there's a very dark surface and then there's the tip. I don't know what that is, and suddenly there's light. So I'm kind of curious. I think meaning it's how bright the tip of the if that's a fish head, for example, you so know, how bright this, that is, and the rest is muted. This I believe is going to be a piece of uh, reticulation silver with oh, that makes sense. overlaid. But what's surprising to me is that. So it, it might be, again, a piece of a hollow form that is the height of the rest of the bezel wall. Um, I mean, and then this is just resting above the stone, is my guess. It's but got it's a look of plexiglass or something. That's what's odd about it. It feels like it's on plexiglass or? Yeah, no, it has a look of a piece of plexiglass. Oh, wow. See, I see this and I this is beautiful druzy. This is quartz druzy. Oh. It's been high polished here and then this is in inset it's where the geode portion oh of that's nice is. yeah this is the, like this is this speaks to my my design aesthetic i use this kind of stone all the time but the the stone cut is spectacular and then their integration of it and this is this is what a lot of i do a one of a kind chain series around a lot of large unusually cut druzies and other fancy stones I, this is what I live for, is you take what nature provides in the patterns and you repeat in your metal. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so there's yes. there's a roughness to this texture that they're that they're um, emulating in the in the um, reticulation silver. Um, what I don't know is whether these are tube set through the stone, which is one way to make sure they stay put, um, but is a very challenging setting to do. So these could either just be floating, in which case you could sort of catch a fingernail under there, and this could be a cutaway, or it could be floating. It's hard to tell whether that continues down through the stone. And then this is also, it looks like it's a fairly heavy wall all the way around, or it's a railing even. It's possible this is set from behind and we just can't see. This could That's be small, half round. Two and a half inches. Yeah, yeah, it's That's not amazing. big. Very small. So, I don't know, this is a lovely piece. I agree, it's beautiful. Oh, and we know the stone cutter on this one too. I might have to go see if Dieter Lorenz still cuts stones, because that's amazing. Yeah, she said that she didn't cut the stones, that he, she had somebody to cut them. Yep, this guy, apparently. Yeah. So, uh, questions about this one? I agree that it could have been photographed to show that stone. The fact that you're seeing it as plexi means that it could have been photographed more clearly to show the Druzy, but Druzy is really hard to get a good sparkly shot of. So, this one I kept because it's an intriguing reminder that stones don't have to be stones. It's also a really neat minimalist piece. I can't quite tell whether the gold is just far enough out to support it. I think it runs across. Yeah, the back looks like a frame. Can you see it in the background? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The gold frame. Yep. So I'm pretty sure that's straight across on those two spots, but very minimal hold point. Um, it's counting on the minimum three points of contact basically um i wish we had a scale on this one i wish we knew how big this piece is oh yeah it, it doesn't say it doesn't but it's a brooch so it can't be too too big um so everybody is choosing one piece or what what are we doing i missed the beginning oh if you have pieces so i just started us off because i pulled some of the more unusual 
hard to know what its setting type is to discuss. If you have ones that you want to submit at the, I, I can pause if you all have ones that you're super excited about. I pulled like a, about half a dozen from the, or maybe a dozen from the book itself, and then a bunch from Pinterest and other places that um, I went down a very, very late night rabbit hole finding things that intrigued me. <laughs> this one's on page 46. Thank you, 46. Um, as we got further into the book, there were fewer that weren't pretty obvious. I always wonder why did he use the pictures of other jewelers and not his own? So his he he does a lot more silversmithing, like object wear. His 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 jewelry work is fairly low key relative to how much he he is famous for making, especially chalices and uh, religious oh. artifacts. Um, and more so than his jewelry. So if you find a piece of John Cogswell jewelry, it's it's a rarity. The thing that most people see most often is he has he only has a couple of production lines he did. The most common is a, a fairly straightforward um, single forge out of a forged out of a single rod uh, um, ginkgo leaf type earring um, that he you also teaches people how he goes about it. So. Um, yeah, I, if you guys are interested, I have a presentation of John's work that we can flip through too, um, but it doesn't have the variety of different settings that we'll that see in, in this stuff. There is a ring here by him. In yep, this, the in one with the iron. Box. I have that later on in the series here. Yeah, 107. Yeah. So this, this is page I, I 68. Up. This is 68. Thank you. I pulled this one up because it has a couple of interesting um, alternative ways. I don't know if this is actually a stone or if it's a casting, but I really liked this combination that looks like they've intentionally, they probably put a wire through into this piece. And then this is a really cool way to protect a stone while still making a connection. Um, otherwise, it looks like it's a fairly straightforward tube set series of tube sets and a little hard to tell that may just be a traditional bezel set with some extra detailing oh muakite yeah i think this is the ammonite here right it, it says I that it's muakite so that would account for that um orangish color um, oh this is yeah that got it oh, so then i don't know what this stone is i thought oh green barrel okay. that must be sorry i think go that's ahead. a real ammonite Yes, it yeah. is. So this is a cool way to protect the ammonite um, by having it set where it, there's no way that the metal is going to brush against it. He's basically made it tall enough. Nicely uh, done. But Michael's another one you can take classes from. Um, he's great. Yeah, so he's out there. And he is not uh, going to be teaching in his studio anymore. I think uh, that's what I heard. Oh. Okay. He's been teaching virtually for Metalworks for a while. Yeah, yeah, he did. I, <clears throat> and he was supposed to be here in Anaheim actually this week. And he canceled because not enough people signed up for the class. Mm. I know. I was so disappointed. Damn. I, uh, I went to Colorado to take the class. I mean, I think I was lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one I put in here just because it's a really interesting reminder to us that settings can be, that they themselves can become settings for other things. So these are tube set, but then they be become the um, the prongs of the stone that's held within them. Really elegant, great addition yes. to our work. That's an earring, right? Those are earrings, yes, yep. Beautiful. Yep. I only need one. <laughs> I only um, have one so, if you have one you can you'll be happy you just wear it wear it around and show it off yeah, exactly <laughs> um so Andy Cooperman also teaches uh he's in fact teaching a small forging for jewelers class in yeah. a few months out here in Portland so if you want to he's a trip. really good teacher too um yeah I'm Very gonna, I was hoping that we were going to have a different class of his because I want to do his uh he has a funky objects connections class that I can't remember the name <laughs> of right now that I've always wanted to take. Um, but I have no clue how this stone is set, guys. 
<laughs> yeah, isn't that the, the setting in the same area where this picture is? What do you mean? What page oh, is that? This is, the, this is the way, this is a version of the... Uh, um, 81. It's 81. Uh, so you think it's a version of one of the cap settings or the... Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a bullet setting with the yeah. setting around. Maybe, yeah. So he's just so we don't actually see the bullet set itself. It's somewhere hidden by the wrapper, by the little yeah. scarf it's got thrown around its neck. Yeah, I, I think could so. Be. Could it be? Could be. Yep, yeah. that that would make sense in this piece. I like. That. Um, I appreciate the action of this piece. A lot of his work has really great movement, even when it's still. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this has both. Like the, I see in this a fashionista with her hand pressed against her back and wearing the long Chanel scarves or whatever. But I also see the the pu pushed out hip and the movement of it. There's a whole lot of activity in here. Yeah, huh. I, I like it. I like this yeah. piece a lot. Could you, could you blow it up a little bit? I'm curious about I think this the one's detail gonna get really of the grainy. shapes. Oh, that helps. Okay. So there's our, our top half. And it looks like some red gold and uh, yellow gold blended and sterling, probably 18 karat down there from the looks of the color. I like how he does these tiny little elements of wrapper and detail. And guys, this is I'm such a fan of this. Those of you that have taken my Bezel's Less Ordinary class, de 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 decorative add-on tiny stones when you have a statement stone balance a piece like nobody's business. A tiny little hint of a different kind of sparkle. I do a lot of work where I'll do a very rough cut stone, like my druzy will be offset by a faceted tiny stone because it gives the bling and the different kind of bling. I never thought about that. That's great info. Do you think he designed it before he made it? You know, I I don't <laughs> no, know. I don't know the his. I don't know Andy's style of working. <laughs> Knowing I get Andy, the feeling from stories I've heard that he's pretty, uh, you know, do his thing in the moment, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it feels Seems like, like he's a technician, though, looking at a lot of his pieces. Yeah, very much. Very it much. He's one of those guys that thinks about why he's doing what he's doing. He doesn't or he, do or he does? He does. He very much, he very much thinks through uh -huh. how to accomplish something and stretches his boundaries. Hmm. So this one is a little more traditional. Um, it has do we, know our, the, do we know the page on that one? That one got uh, 89. Wrong. Thank you. Uh, I don't see. It is on page 89. And so I think we have here a tension set between the platinum. T platinum is always a great choice for tension setting because it is less likely to flex than the gold over time. And then, of course, we have a whole bunch of bead set. A little hard to see the bead detail, but... So the tension's them. coming from the side? Yep. And then it's just resting on the bow? Below. I don't think it's... Actually, if he's done it right, it's probably just barely above the bow because you don't want mm -hmm. your metal... In case there's any movement in the work, you don't want the coulette tapping down against metal or else it might chip. So I'm betting it's just the angle of the cut, and there's probably a very narrow gap right there. Oh, yeah. I also wouldn't be surprised if there's a stone set at the end of each of these, and we just can't see it from this angle. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a it's hell of a peridot, by the way. <laughs> I don't yeah. know that I've seen a peridot that clean and that size ever in my in-person looking at stones. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so again, a nice use of decorative element. If you're going to build a thick wall of something, put bling in it. Do you think he go. put that bar in it to stabilize those two sides then? Or do you possibly, think it's possibly possibly it's a it's a make sure it doesn't widen on its own addition? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's still going to be a challenging set because it's a platinum and be thick and then C you're trying to get it flush so how much tension is held by the work he's done to this and how much is added 
by putting something that is potentially soldered. It looks like there might be a little ring of gold holding it, maybe a tube through a tube or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I don't. I, I, it might be a stabilizer. It might just be a decorative element. It might be both. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Can't give you a better answer than that. We're, we're all guessing on these. This is one of my favorite John stories. Um, so 107. John and his wife Thank have been you. living. Sorry, go ahead. 107. 107. So John and his wife had been living at their house for a few years, and um, he, they were doing some preparation of a garden bed. And he apparently came across the um, the front half, like some absurd chunk of a 1957 Chevy or something like that, that was deep underground, had been completely buried and had rusted out in these really cool ways. Um, it, it may have, you know, it may have gotten exaggerated in stories. It may have just been the front, uh, you know, the front cover of it or something like that. But whatever it was, he had a fair chunk of material that had rusted in all these beautiful ways. Um, and he uses this piece when he's teaching as an example of um, finding the beauty in the material um, and working with what you have. Um, so he's got this piece that he domed that he's embracing the rust. Um, and oh. this is, ultimately this is gonna be like those cap settings that are the curve, they're just upside down. Um, so the it's it's a it is held by this wall, but he built it so that the piece sits in here. I think so. This dome is part of the whole cap setting. He may have even set it from behind, from the looks of it. So it might have been that back set bullet setting that we looked at. I don't know. And but how is it going into the sides? Here. Yeah, I think that's soldered. But it may be, I don't know if this piece flips or not. I don't know if he yeah. designed it to rotate. I've never seen it in person. It's just one he uses in his presentations. Um, obviously, he forged it. That's his jam. Uh, and you can see some of the hammer work on it. And he, these were clearly forged um, and then hammer textured. Uh, but I, this piece is beautiful to me in, in both its creation and its cleanness of line while also managing to have so much mess to the material. I love the awesome. texture on around it because it's almost yep. mimicking the iron itself. Yeah. Looks yeah. Yeah. Like it, sorry, go ahead. Looks like lava. Yeah, it really does. It does look like a, a chunk of lava rock. Uh, but no, it was a car found in his garden. Oop, it bounced out on me. So uh, so that's where we got on the ones that I had pulled from the book. This is switching us into, oh, no, this is still from the book. Um, 118. Thank you, 118. So the reason I pulled this one is because who doesn't love diamonds set under quartz or diamonds? It looks like it's diamonds set under diamonds, not oh. diamonds set under quartz. So... <laughs> The, the factor of having such an unbelievable clear diamond up top, I could have sworn that was quartz. It's so bright. It's so clear. Um, and then having your bead set down below with all the other sparkles and it becomes this mirror creation is just amazing. Um, so it looks like these are probably white gold. Unclear to me whether this may be a tension setting ultimately. From the looks of it, it's a little hard to tell with all the sparkly factor in there to see how it cuts through. Um, it may have a little bit of corner over the end at each. So now well, it looks like maybe there's a little cutaway. Now I would say this is probably a tension setting. Mm, wonderful. Or, yeah, tension slash channel something. Um, and then bead setting, bead setting, bead setting. And man, does the that's that's possibly I'm not a big fan of bead set. But that is one of the most impressive uses of bead setting that I've seen. Wouldn't there be like what you did um, last time, which was the channel, the channel set? Yeah. So except that usually the faux channel is usually multiple stones. Uh -huh. It's designed to be faking when you put uh, like around a ring and so on. Um, it, it, the difference between a channel and a faux channel, as I understand it from what I what John has explained to us, is that a channel set will have actual cut in for each stone under the lip, whereas mm -hmm. a faux channel is literally just an alleyway into which the stones slide. 
I think that's the core difference. Um, and so there's only one stone here, so it wouldn't, it would be either, I guess, you know, it's been cut in, but there's, it's slid in, but there's only one slide. So it, it, it officially, it's probably a, a real channel set or a real combination channel slash pressure. I'm bet I'm tension. I'm betting this is intended to be cut and then tensioned in. Um, okay, that's where we stop with the ones that I got from there. So um, anybody want to show any other pictures from the book or do you want to pause and show me what I you've got you that to, you have questions? I want you to go back to page 57. And I know we talked about it before, but I just can't remember what you said. <laughs> 57. 57. Uh, let me pull that one up. I don't think I copied that one out of the book. So let me see. Where's my book? Give me a minute. I got to dig it out of the... I'm sorry. Oh. No, that's okay. I just have to figure out where I put it, where the, where the book is in my many open screens right now. Uh... So I guess my curiosity is, is that one long piece of 18 karat gold and what are those rivets, what are those dots on the side, on the left side? Yeah, I am not sure. This might be a bead. Let me get this up so that everybody can see what we're talking about. Uh, I just got to find the right page. Come on, scroll, scroll, scroll. Which chapter is that in? Chapter bezels, still bezels, okay. What did you do? Go through and take a picture of every photo in the book? No, not every one. I had I picked some that I thought were most interesting to us. Okay. Because I don't I don't want to put the, the text of John's book up on screen. Um, well, I'm impressed that you may have that page 57 maybe. In <laughs> I just have to get to it is the problem. Uh, come on. 57 bezel setting yeah chapter three chapter three. Oh, i went too far no i'm still in the bezel setting so the problem is that it is differently indexed on the uh is it pa uh, page 57 it is page 57 but it's not when it's in the um in the in the text and i've got to find it in the text uh, in, in the scan. Chapter three, that'll get me there. And what's the question, Wendy? Uh, she, she wants to look at the, the image up close, so I'm trying to pull it up for us. Ah, yeah, this is weird. I don't know. How would this be made? I don't know. I will take a look at it. Maybe I skipped it because I was nervous to talk about it. I don't know. I didn't see, I don't think I saw this one. <laughs> as I was when scanning. we were in bezels, you, you brushed I did. over. Yeah. Okay. But um, of course, I don't remember what you said. Yeah, I don't either. And if I can bring it bring it up big scale, maybe it'll help me remember too. Oh my goodness, where is this page? I hope that all the images that are in the printed book are also found in the text version. That would be a bummer if I can't find it because of that. Adjusting the fit. Give me my picture. And then... It says that part of it is platinum, and I'm not seeing platinum except for that white bezel, but I don't think that would be platinum, but I don't know that much the white, about it. The white yeah. bezel might be the platinum. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Wow, where is this piece? Sorry, guys, I don't mean to leave you sitting there. I think I'm in the right area. There we go. And is that reticulated gold or is that just glass? I don't no. know. It's sort of weird looking, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I couldn't. Is that like uh, hammered, hammered from the back? Say that it again. might be set from the back a little bit, except there are those two prongs up there or it could be. Yeah, it could be done with 
flowing metal. So it's molten and you're, you know, putting it down. Hang on, I'll bring this up so that everybody can see. Save as PNG. Did you find it, you mean? I did find it. I just have to. Oop. No, I don't want to. Oh, okay, okay. So those two prongs are holding the stone on each side. At each end, yeah. But then okay. what are those rivets on the side doing? What is the purpose of that? Well, uh, it looks like there might be a couple of prongs on the top that you can't see. Right. So it right. could be holding it in in like a, a long box and with the prongs on the ends. Yeah, the prongs are on the ends, but we're talking about the three little thingies on the left side. They may it's just decorative. be decorative. It's possible. Um, that's a little too close to really look cleanly. But what's intriguing to me is this that feels like it's running through the stone, but maybe it's just back support. So it's possible that rods are running down below the stone and then there's cross pieces where you guys are seeing the little dots. For support? Um, the, mm -hmm. As supports. Yeah, it might be cross hatch supports, but I don't know why you'd need that when you've got the walls unless it's running through the stone possibly like i'd be intrigued to see the back side of this to see if this is kind of bead like well and it's that a clean and i you would it would fracture if you put a hole yeah. in that way probably yeah um this looks to me it actually looks kind of like weld marks you know like steel welding Almost ah. as if they took a rod of heavy gold and sort of melt, melt welded to it, mm -hmm. or it was um, forged um, from the back. You know, it could have been chasing and repoussé style, but there's some intriguing swirls there that kind of more remind me of a forge weld, a steel weld than anything else. And I'm betting the platinum is the diamond setting. Um, yeah. But it looks kind of like it's box box shaped beneath it. So resting possibly on at least these three sides and then not resting on anything other than maybe the lip and then the prongs. Or it's, so it's but what's, yeah, what's what's fine. What I'm finding odd is these bars behind it. Like, why do you need those if you've got the frame? Um, now, see, that is just a lighting issue. I thought it was reflection of light. Oh, yeah, that's could right. be. So you think there's nothing back there behind it? I, right. I I think it's in a like a like you say it's in a box setting. Huh. Could be. It just feels like those run from that. The, the whatever that, that is. Huh. But yeah, I don't have any more specifics on that. Um, yeah. Well, it's thank also you for cut. It's hard to see. Like, it mm -hmm. looks like a shallow um, chessboard cut, maybe. Okay. Well, thank you for... Sure. Um, <laughs> Any others I in the, book? the puzzle? How Stay about... Again. Let me see. No, Sorry, I keep talking over you guys. What, what was that? Anybody? Any others that you want to see? That that piece, by the way, is by Degama Designs. Yeah, and I was looking online and it, I ended up in history. Okay, so this is on page 138. It's a You want the one that's on 138? Oh, yeah, cool. Okay. Oh, my I, goodness. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to know, the holes, are those rivets? Um, so Michael Boyd teaches a stone in stone class. Right. And I suspect they are rivet like, they're like tubes set through the stone. Okay. So you drill through the stone. Um, and they, depending on what you're doing with them, you either, uh, rivet them or you, um, you set them once you've got this, this, the larger stone in place. Behind oh, it. Oh, I got you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, let me see if I can get to that one and bring it up for you guys. So uh, he did first the rivets. No. Um, I'm betting that what he did was uh, 
uh, build a um, a frame. Oh, not this is not searchable. Damn it. Uh, hang on a sec. Let me see if I can get this one up on screen. Um, he he probably built the um, the structure of the back plate of the circle very carefully cut his stones and what looks like maybe some bone is it no um oh maybe they do mortar righty talking uh, about 138 yep 138 okay that's wow. bone. Uh, then, whale bone. is it whale bone yeah the white part okay cool um and then so he had to carve all of them positioning the holes where he wanted the rivet points Right. And then he would have um, put the tubes in place, either soldered if possible, if he's really good at fitting, um, or he might have to drill after positioning and, and rivet them through. But I suspect he's he's that good and he is um, connecting them through. The one that's really curious to me, uh, the series that are curious to me are actually the larger stones, the blue um, the the jade the mossitsit the uh, black jade and the I'm betting the blue is oh he uh, cuts it. these things I've seen how he cuts them he he cuts all his stones oh yeah then then absolutely he's cutting them to his design and yeah. running the the tubing through to set things in what's interesting to me I would love to see the back of it to see if the beadwork that is in between the little stones is riveted at the back. I can't imagine it'd be otherwise. Um, but maybe he has magic. Is anybody taken one of his stone in stone classes? Yeah, he this little uh, gold uh, things, the little beady gold things. Mm -hmm. That's he he um, uh, makes uh, mm -hmm. ball, balls on one side, and then balls on the other side. But I have never seen anyone do that. He puts the the Smith little torch at the hottest, hottest. Yep. And then he goes for a second. Pop, pop. That's it. Done. Uh huh. <laughs> and it's magic. Yeah. Okay, so he's actually soldering the bead. The he's doing the he's probably doing the bead that's on top of the stone off the off the work, and the behind yeah. bead is done with the little torch. But I'm talking about yeah yeah that's a, I'm talking about the rivets. Yeah. How do yep. you make these rivets? So the dumorarity. Anyone what was know what kind of stone that is? Dumorarite. The blue one. It's that blue. There's a there's a, a Y. It should be an E and e, yeah. It must be on the left. Okay. Dumorarite yeah. is is kind of like a denim blue. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see it. It's a beautiful stone. But how do you make the rivets? It looks like the, the it's one piece. How do you make that? Two rivets. Yep. Yeah, so he's either doing, so for the, for the little stones, he's doing some kind of tube setting. But it sounds like if he's that controlled with his torch, he's probably soldering them. Yeah. And then the, the bead rivets, it sounds like he's balling up the wire on one end. Yes. Running his wire through to the back side and maybe balling the back side too, from what you guys are describing. Yeah, but I don't know. Be... There's so uh, this is he's on my list of people I'd like to take a class from, um, and so he's he's been known to use glue. Has he? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. He uses shh, glue for shh. sure. Don't tell the secrets of the universe. What's <laughs> wrong with glue? There's nothing wrong with glue, but well, I still don't know how to make the rivets. Um, are they one piece or are they the, just the circular piece? Uh, this is confusing. So do you, are you talking about the little dots or are you talking about the, the things that he's got stones set into, the small No, stone? Uh, look at the mass it. There yep. are two tiny dots. That's the gold. I know. Yep. And then two rivets. Yeah, but those right. rivets is a hole. It goes through. It's so a tube. He's, tubes. he's doing a tube. He's probably flaring the part that is resting on the mass it, it, running the tube through. And doing either soldering or if he, if he if that's how he chooses to do it or um, riveting the backside, but it, it's all about control of your tools so that you're not tapping the mossitsit when you're tapping the rest. That's that's oh, speculation uh, on my part. He's a master. He might have better ways. 
How would you do it, uh, Rachel? Mm -hmm. So I would, would, if I were trying to do stone and stone like that, um, I would, if the stone that I was setting it over, I knew could take uh, a little bit of uh, careful hammering on my part, I would um, solder my tube to my back plate and run the, the, the moss sit sit in this case over it. Uh -huh. And then gently with uh, some kind of flaring tool like a, a um, punch or something, very, very carefully flare, trying not to tap the actual stone, just trying to do a straight down tap of my, of my rivet. It doesn't need a lot of flare, but I am not a stone in stone person. And this the, the challenge here is he actually has three layers of stone. He's got the black background stone on top of which he has the moss sit sit on top of which, or, sorry, it's not three layers of stone. The rivets are on top of the moss sit sit, which is on top of another stone. So that may have some different approaches. Maybe, maybe there are, um, uh, maybe it's a fully built bezel that is then uh, attached to some rods that run through the background stone, or he may be using those tubes as the sole connector. I don't know the, the uh, specifics. Yeah, if you use the tubes as a sole connector, how do you do the flaring that it looks so perfect? It's really a practice, practice, practice thing. Um, that, so there's, there's different tools for it, and... Uh, Lopez, I'm forgetting, Roberto Lopez, uh, you know who Robert. I'm talking about. Pardon? Robert. Robert Lopez. Yeah, Robert yeah. Lopez used to make a tool that he stopped making for a while, and I'm hoping he gets back to, that helps with flaring. Um, mm -hmm. But but, all, but I, I haven't seen it produced in a long time, so I've been looking for it, for it to come back on the market so I could buy myself one. But it doesn't just have to be a, um, a dapping tool. It could be, you could look for some more conical shapes, um, like a plumb bob usually has a good starting flare. And it's about use... the tiniest of taps to just That's start plumb bob. opening. But you can use a, 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 burnish, a narrow burnishing tool or make your own burnishing tool to run around it. What's That's where bob? I'd be nervous because I would be, I would be worried about burnishing down onto the stone. I feel like a, a direct press downward with tapping, I have more control over, but yeah, but Boyd is a lapidary, so you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? What about what's a blob? What did you say? Blob, John? Blob, plum. Plum a plumb bob. bob is a, a plumb bob is a is a builder's tool. It's the thing that they use to figure out that something is directly uh, perpendicular to the ground. Um, it looks like a little a uh, little spinny top. It's got a point down at one end, and it's just sort of a, a blob this of piece. Can you see? metal. It's, really Here, let me... it's an Archimedes tool. <laughs> it is. It's a very. It's an ancient tool. Um, here, I'll find a, a plumb bob for us. So interweave. Michael Boyd did a DVD through interweave. Stone on stone. Yeah. So you can take. You can just watch his class you just watch it oh yeah. this is amazing so the nice thing about plumb bob is they come <laughs> in a bunch of different angles and materials whoa and you this is another find them in hardware stores yeah i can see um sorry i interrupted you wendy uh uh he's got an an interweave workshop that you can just pay and take the videos get the videos buy the video i'm sure by now it's download but um who knows if interweave is still going i'm sure right. they are but right they, they are they're still selling all those videos yeah but you um, know that that dvd is you know at least 15 years old so it's I'm doesn't sure mean it's that the updated. technology has changed a whole heck of a lot <laughs> If I can't find one of his classes that I can take in person, although it's always a good excuse if he's teaching at Metalworks to be able to go back to Boston for a bit. Yeah, um, he's teaching the Masters something. The masters. Yeah, the Summer with the Masters program. Yeah. Which, yeah, any of the people they bring in for that are pretty spectacular. Um, were there other book um, pictures or should I go on to the ones that I got that are not from the book that I wanted to show? Or his. Or do I you know. have images you want to show? Mm, not me nobody i don't okay. have any all right then onward we go i gotta get past all the ones we just did 
Okay. I don't remember what I was searching for when this one came up. And it did not, it's unfortunately, this was a Flickr or Pinterest that didn't have credit to it. So if anybody knows the artist, this is a terrible for the stone setting, but really cool idea. Because this yeah. tips, these are hinged. So the stone goes sliding back and forth. Oh, cool. Um, really neat cage setting. Um, probably, I'm guessing this is going to be a borosilicate glass or something and not actually stone, in which case it's a little less likely to chip chip, but it still will get scuffed over time. And setting it in there is got to be a matter of pulling the bars apart enough to pop it in there and then straightening them out, I'm guessing. But that's pure speculation. I just love the idea of this mechanic. Yeah, that's a cool piece. Yeah, I think you, you your guess is correct because you can solder on the other side and nothing will happen to the glass. Well, yeah, I was going to say, if it if it is glass, they might be able to solder it in place instead of having to pull it and, and position it. So you may be right that um, that it's purely the glass can take it if that's what it is. Um, I can't quite be sure it's, it could also be an agate of some kind with that patterning, but it looks a little too clean. Um, this captivates me, both yeah. in the cut of this football shaped stone, that is one of the most yeah. gorgeous pieces of rutile I've seen, or I never remember which is rutile and which is, uh, terminated. Um, but look at that tension setting. That is a tension setting. Yeah. Wow. And then, of course, our bead setting. So well, what, what's a, what is uh, holding the the rain? What's making the rain to stay together, not opening? Tension set. This is this is work hardened material, thick enough that it's not going to move easily, and it would have to move a fair amount with how far they've put the stone through. Um, but this is the same principle of our very last setting that we did, which I'll again redo with more interesting and thicker material, um, remembering to put it up high enough as well. Um, but this is that same basic principle is the, the strength and tension of the metal when it's forged out or however they've, they've tensioned it is holding that stone in place. Could somebody with strong hands torque it apart and pull the stone? Sure. Um, but this takes some thinking in terms of design because we want the stone to not be necessarily resting on the hand. So there's a design element of bringing this curve far enough in that it fits the stone, but probably just brushes past the top of the finger, um, so that it's positioned well and doesn't start just getting the oils of our hands on it as much as it would if it was touching down. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, neat. Neat setting, neat stone. Questions on that one? Is this, this what you're saying is applicable for all kinds of uh, settings that have the stone open? Well, it's not all kinds of settings. It's, it's the tension setting needs the factor of keeping enough strength. The tension settings are usually around the, the type of material and the thickness and the work hardening you've done more than they are about the type of stone. There are definitely certain stones that are better suited to a tension setting than not. Um, so in the tension setting we did in the book, we were using a small faceted stone. Um, and so we could, as John had us do it, it was with six gauge or eight gauge. Um, as I found, that's not enough in silver for me. If it were in gold or platinum, that would be no problem because it would, st it would keep its tension. Um, but uh, it could be that you could, you could technically do a cab in a tension setting. You just have to get the cut positions to follow the curve. It's a little harder to cut in the curve of a cab than it is to cut. Uh, we already have drill bits that are sized just mm -hmm. right for doing that angle cut that comes in from the edge of a faceted stone. So the challenge is getting the right support in what you cut in based on the type of stone you have. But I see a lot of tension settings with like an interesting abstract chunk, excuse me, chunk of watermelon tourmaline or something. It's all about your patience in cutting in the support. 
<coughs> and making sure you have the strong material behind it. Um, so this is one that, um, not necessarily super high end in terms of visual impact, but really an interesting use of uh, a capture. Um, so the stone itself isn't directly held. It's kind of, it, it's trapped between the layers with the rivets. And this looks like it's a, maybe a work in progress. I'm betting these are getting capped off um, either as rivets or with something, again, we could screw connect onto the tops of them. But I just wanted you guys thinking about that idea that it doesn't always have to be gripping the stone. Sometimes right. it can just be supporting. This is actually kind of a relative of that boulder setting that we did, at the, that we looked at at the be very beginning, right? Something trapping it, if that is in fact how that boulder opal was set. Um, and tubes and rivet, like this is one that you could do, technically you could do a version of this without any soldering. You could do without the wall if you have the right stone and you do plates and capture between tubes with rivets. Is that a, a Drusi? I think it's a Drusi. It's not, a, this is the best picture I was able to get. Um, so yeah. Tab settings is a highly underrated um, no solder technique. And this is one of the nicer implementations of a tab setting that I've seen. Um, it's one of the things I teach in my Bezels Less Ordinary class, just because it's cool to be able to do something quick and dirty um, if you don't have access to fire. Um, but this is a really elegant use of the cutaways becoming the the prongs of the tab set. It's a necessity when you're enameling because you have very mm. few options. Yeah, if you don't have access to stones. some good... Yeah. yeah. If you don't have access to some good... Uh, um, soft material for it um it's tough cab, setting a, an enameled cab or something so how do you think they um did they put the prongs first before they textured it because i would think it would get work hardened which is not a bad way. thing in a prong if you think about it um no, let's see let's look it. at yeah. the I'm betting there's pattern on the inside of each prong. I'm betting they did the patterning and then pierced it. Cut. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just because these, these marks look like they continue mm -hmm. in some places beyond the edge, but maybe not. Could go either way. It, it does give you the benefit of work hardening the metal, which is not a bad thing when you're creating a prong set. Mm -hmm. And I like good. this simplistic bale piece. Yeah. It blends in. Charity Hall does a great job with tab setting. Yeah. If do you are you familiar I, with her? I don't know. Charity Hall, you said? Yeah. Put yeah. them on the list of people to look for. And she's done um stuff at Metalworks and at nice. Idlewild. Okay. Um this one is cool. Oh, I love the it's... movement in this design. Say again? Oh, I said I love the movement in yeah. the design. Yep. You can feel how heavy the rock is. Yeah. Yep. But it's also cradled and comfortable, and it's built in the bale. And um, it's a beach rock, which everybody has picked up a beach rock that has a special significance to them. Um, I like that it's got forged elements. I like that it's got, it creates prongs. Um, and that this has become like a whole unit that just it almost continues like a roller coaster throughout the piece. Um, so I just was really captured by such a simple evocative line that clearly took a little bit of thinking to get all the layout the way you needed. It's not a, it's not a small feat to follow that abstract shape of the rock. I could see that with, with the sea glass, putting sea yep. glass in there yep. too. Sea glass. Yeah. And I mean, the, the possibilities on this kind of a design sequence are endless. You man, you you take Michael Boyd's class, learn how to set a diamond in through that rock, <laughs> and you've upped your level. You add some gold elements. This is I hope that whoever Nicole Miller is, she's done a series out of this because it's lovely. So this one um, on the, whatever board I found it on, there was a lot of how would you do that discussion. Um, 
And the general consensus is that this is uh, using a welder to close it up because this stone doesn't actually have much. This is also a capture, much like that quartz druzy piece we just looked at. It's that this ring is sort of a, a just snug enough to be above the piece. And this ring is just snug enough to be below the piece but there's not really a way in or out with the stone. So it may be that the final connections were welded here with a, a arc welder, puck welder, whatever. Um, or it is actually just barely big enough and they pushed in in some spots that we can't really see from the angle we've got. But it has some really lovely lines to it and like this idea of creating little portals, windows that show the side of the stone. And I suspect the back of the stone shows nicely um, and integrating the whole unit. Like I could I could see building this as a set that is, you know, all one wire frame that you've built that all into. And then you fold it over the stone and do your last welds. This has oh. six windows. Six little circles. Those little circles—they look like um, like uh, ship portal portholes to me, but I think they're just circle, you know, just jump rings, flattened square wire jump rings. But it's a nice addition, isn't it? Yes. And, yeah. And we only there were only a couple of John's projects that we saw additional decorative elements to the sides, but it, so I want you guys to come out of the Cogswell portion of this and start looking at. Um, people who do finely detailed um, uh, wedding jewelry in particular. And you'll see that people are doing a lot with small wire bits between the layers of their um, bezel settings, their prong settings rather in particular. So prong settings, they may be the band that we learned with our tweezers hold, but then in between they've done a series of vine-like connectors or a series of these jump rings to add decorative components to it um, and start to look at the fine detail on some um, some settings, especially in high-end wedding jewelry. And you'll see what I mean. Another really super cool tab setting variant where it's a cut in and a cut out at the same time. Like this just has grip all over it. It's It just looks like the, the stone is trying to escape the ring. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's a really great tab setting. This one has so much interest to me in terms of movement um, of the work, which I always love. So there's going to be left-right movement. There's going to be rotational movement as you move. Um, but also, I don't know whether the wires come down into a bead or whether these are full spheres. This is just barely enough around the sphere that it could entirely be held by the claws that are gripping it. Um, but it looks like a slightly forged, probably pierced out or wire soldered together into either three or four. I think it must be four points. Four. I can see four. Yeah. Four um, and and I it think just, I've seen this in the past, but I don't know who it was. Yeah. Anybody yeah. that we can find, I'm happy to put credit where credit is due on this because it really is, you know, it's no no fair to an artist if they're being talked I about. I love that they created a T. And then they went, you know, they created the whole piece, created the T. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how they got the T in there. I guess they'd have to solder it afterwards, right? This? And then let it fall. So are you talking about this part? Um, I was talking about the T um, above, right there, that's um, letting it hang. So or is this it just a wire? I thought it was a T. I think it is. A, it is. I think it's the balled up wire thr drilled through. And so probably my order of operations would be to make these, make my wires and run them through and make these pieces separately. And then my final act would be oh, soldering okay. on the prong to the end of each wire. Probably then, how I, I think they're T's. Otherwise, how are they going to move? Yeah, because they turn. Oh, I see what you're saying. T. That's why I thought it was a T, so they could turn around. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which actually, yeah, that actually makes sense. This one does look a little bit more tea-like than these. These two look like beads, but yeah, I'm betting you're right. So yeah. um, again, it would be first action would be to solder and create the T out of two cross sections of wire, thread it down, straighten it out, solder on the thing that will stop it from ever getting back out of that hole. Um, yeah. 
your alternative is to pull it up and through and bend it down and put your T connector at top and then slide it back down and straighten it. I feel like it'd be easier to get your straight lines and your, your lengths after you put that through. Do you think the three circles are connected? I do think loose? so. I think they look a little soldered right here. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, wouldn't they wouldn't have to be. It'd kind of be interesting to have moving parts between them and, you know, be able to swap them in and out. I want my squares mixed in with my circles today or whatever. Again, yeah. a super elegant little collection that could be made out of this one. Um, and if we can find the artist, I hope that we yeah, can. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can do several pieces with this. Uh, and you can use those spheres. Maybe yep. the, I have seen now the stun, uh, not stun, uh, the gem, gem, gem ball. Uh, uh, the gem, the people who sell gems, they're selling a lot of little spheres, like diamond spheres, emerald Ooh. spheres. So that that's something that can be used with this. Uh, yeah. Because I was thinking, who's going to use the, <laughs> the spheres? How do you set them? Right, right. Here it is. You can well, set them. Well, but we've, we've learned. Remember, gem balls are in the pearls chapter. So the same way that we were setting pearls is how John gave us to set the gem balls. Uh, well, I have been absent, Rachel. Now you make me feel bad. Oh, that's right. Sorry, you might not have seen that, that session, but no, they're all up, so you can you can watch them at your leisure. Okay. So this one is intriguing to me because I can't tell if this is hand-fabricated or cast. Could be either. I really like, again, that there's movement in the piece and that it flips around, but it's not a terribly high-end stone. So it has a very 1960s yeah. art jewelry vibe to it. Um, I the like outside... that it just got minimal prongs. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, are you done? Yep, yep. Okay. The outside piece, uh, you're going to laugh, but it reminds me of, you know, an old-fashioned tire, you know, the inside of a tire. Uh-huh. You know, and it looks like that all the air's out of it. And so it looks like somebody forged it. Yeah. And then they just uh, twisted it and bent it. Yep. And then, um, and I love the look of it. And I think mm -hmm. that's separate from all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so it's a great use of negative space inside of what you're calling mm -hmm. the tire. Uh, and I think you may be right that it could be a forged out piece. It could be either. This could easily be a, like a sand cast element yep. too um it, look, it looks hollow to me at the top on the inside so it, mm -hmm. up here you think that's hollow so it's double on the layered. inside where that white is where the white part is yeah and that not just the twit oh i see what you're saying that it, so i think that might be the shadow behind it yeah, I, I think, think it's, it's a photograph off. yeah it's a shadow yeah, I think this lifts up off the ground. So I'm not sure this is a hollow form, although it might be concave under there. It's a little hard to but tell. That's what I meant. A concave. Oh, it's yeah. a pendant, right? It looks like it's intended as a pendant. Yeah, I suppose you mm -hmm. could make two of them and make earrings, which would be a super cool. And it looks like it spins, move. right? Yeah, it looks like it spins. Yeah, that's that's like part of what captured me on this one. It almost That's a weird look. Like there's only one tab on the front, on the left. Well, so it's also a heavy walled bezel. So it feels like the artist was making a choice of needing a little more security on it. Um, or it may be that it that, you know, because it's an abstract rock shape instead of something that's got a good flat surface to it, it may have needed one point to be a little more solid, and these others are tucked under. And if we flip it, we might see there's a couple prongs on oh, the you're other right. side. Yeah. Right. Um, no way yeah. to tell with only the one photograph. It's my eye went to the one single prong. <laughs> Which I, that's part of what I find appealing. I like, it's like I'm hanging on by the skin of my teeth, kind of. Yeah. You know, if I move, if I, if I go too fast when I'm spinning, I need to hold on to something on the Ferris wheel. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's missing a prong. This you think is so? A, you think there was one here yeah, maybe? I think so. Oh yeah, it does look like that. Maybe it came off. It, does look mm -hmm. like there are prongs in back too, but a, a, a random pebble is a really hard thing to set well. Um, and I think this was an embrace the the rock kind of setting. It's vintage, right? I don't know. I don't you know. know. A lot of these were like, I would go on a stroll for 
um, unusual stone settings and a lot of um, people's Pinterest boards would come up with not enough credit. You must uh, have been up all night. <laughs> oh, it was it was a couple more hours than I intended to be going down some rabbit holes, but it's very um, easy to do that. <laughs> so well, it's this is called there. Isn't this called there? Uh, I don't know if it is a Calder. I don't think it is. I think it's Calder inspired. And yeah. it's one of the reasons I love it. But I actually pulled it. It's a fairly straightforward setting. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a glue component since it doesn't look fully set over, but I can't get close enough with this granularity. Um, but one of the reasons I pulled this one is that I want to use it for, I, I teach an inspired design kind of workshop, like how to get your brain thinking in new directions for design. And one of my most basic exercises is to use a geometric shape in a variety of different ways. And I wanted to point out how these are simple lines, right? These are the, they are, they are a sing, single repetitive concept and yet it moves. Like it's, amazing how much action there is just from the flinging of these parts and that they've got is this really nice the being that creates that kind of splash and the dimensionality and i i want to challenge you all if you're if you are ever struggling with design to go back to simple pick yes. a form a line a, a shape that appeals to you and push it to its limits because this is this is just off the hook, just stellar action in a piece. Do you um, think um, the creating of this piece that they took, um, let's say, one long piece of wire, they got the ends where they wanted it, and then they folded them, and then this is a collection of all different lengths of folded pieces? But what do you think? I, so I can only say how I would be building a piece like this because I know that I do similar construction exercises whenever I'm doing one of my one-of-a-kind chains um, and I start by uh, making a bunch of varietals of a single shape so I right. would probably start by making uh, I would forge a set of folded wires um, and it looks like maybe you know maybe you're you get a bunch of different straight lengths forge your ends find the bend and then mm -hmm. have them all hanging out together in a pile and start playing, um, you know, build a, build a block with them, layering them. What I mm -hmm. like about what they've got in here is that they've built uh, up and down and not just side to side. Um, and then I'd start building units out of the combos that appeal to me. Um, and so I might end up, as in this case, as they did with one longer, narrower V, and then a couple of semi matched, like you're not intentionally matching, but you're, you know, maybe taking, you're pulling aside four of your three inch lengths and three of your, you know, six of your five inch lengths and whatever. So you've got pairs and you're making concept pairs instead of literal matching pairs. And then you've soldered those units together and then you build. And you make maybe, maybe she made or he made 10 of these units and picked the ones that appealed most. That's how I, my brain goes, but different artists may go differently. This, this could have been like intimately drawn out and measured out and their drawing and their design might have every specific length of silver that they intend to use planned out before they cut a single piece. I don't know. I like the way they're laying it. down. Say again? I like that they have some action in them, mm -hmm. movement, but they're laying down really nicely. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's one of the challenges that I run into, and it's why you see me building some of these larger, especially with the hollow forms, larger pieces, where you'll see on, if you follow me on my Instagram, you'll see that I do um, sort of staggered development of them, because I sometimes need to step away and figure out what is not working for me technically. The larger, the more the more structural a piece is, the more the connections are critical to how it rests on the body. And I can see a piece like this needing a lot of um, pause, look at how it lays, adjust, et cetera. Um, and, and I do the same thing when I'm, you know, this hollow form that I'm working on now, what kind of connections I make are still up in the air. I'm going to do hinging at the front five 
but I'm still trying to decide what kind of movement I want around the collar um, when I when I put them together. And I've got a couple of options, but I haven't narrow, narrow, narrowed it down yet. So think about, yeah, think about form and function. And the larger you work or the more pieces there are to a given project, the more how they tie together will work. I've made pieces I've spent hours and hours on that I absolutely hated because I didn't give enough thought to just how they would rest folding over um, the neckline, folding over the collarbone. Um, so do you teach a class on develop developing designs? That's the design workshop I was talking about. I haven't taught it in years. I've only taught mini versions of it, occasionally like a four hour version of it. Um, and it's really best as a hands-on because I give you, it's, it's right. basically going back to kindergarten a little bit. I give you a bunch of physical materials and you start playing with them. And it's really great when it's not just jewelers. I do it as a, as a general artist's inspiration workshop. Um, and because then you get crosstalk about mediums and materials and start thinking about what you have. If you like me, I get locked into, I'm working in metal and stone and I need to occasionally have my butt kicked to think about other media, um, like weaving, <laughs> Uh, and things like that. So um, it, I prefer that as a hands-on class, so I haven't taught it virtually. Um, I, if I get some breathing space, I might try to figure out how, it's really a collaborative class. It's sort of like, I don't want you guys sitting alone in your studio. Um, just, it, it works better when there are people to bounce some of this methodologies off of and to work as a team. Um, like one of the exercises I have people do uh, I don't know if you guys ever did this as a kid where you would um, uh, fold over a piece of paper and one person would draw something and, and then hide it beneath the fold, just leaving a little bit of it hanging out. And the next person would have to draw without looking at what was under the fold and the next and yeah. the next no, similar exercises that. to that. But I remember really nice. Say again. I said, I've never done that such a thing, but it sounds nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's getting out of your own head because we all do it. Like if you've ever been in a design rut, it's one of the reasons I recommend taking more classes because sometimes even if it's not a technique you expect to incorporate in your work, sometimes it just kicks your rear end into gear. Um, and, you know, you get some inspiration just from having learned something new. Um, so Rachel. Yep. Go back to your sentence that said, um pushing to the limits yeah so that's what you do in your design class you push to the limits so then are there steps that you take to push to the i would have no clue how to push to the limits so some you know, of what that, does is, that mean? yeah so th so that's a personal line for a lot of people um what i mean so i was talking about i uh, my personal uh, act is to sometimes say okay how can i do something more than I thought I could with it. And sometimes that's as simple as, um, you know, uh, how do I look at the thing that makes me nervous? I'm going to use Carmen as a good example of this. Carmen, you have been charging forward and pushing your limits. You're like, I'm just going to try it. What the heck? What's the worst that can happen? Right. And so you've been doing a great job of going beyond what you previously had tried. Um, and, and it's really, it's, some of it is the, the being willing to try. One of my biggest discoveries, man, I was taking a Jim Binion, Chris Plouffe class on making Mocha Megane billets at Rio Grande. Oh, that would have been a blast. Oh, it was wonderful. If you ever get the chance from either of them, they're both spectacular and they're a really wonderful team of teachers because they have very different areas of communication and, and expertise, even though it's all about Mokume. Um, but I, <laughs> we were, we were working in copper and brass for our billets that for our test billets, but they said, well, now's the time day three or something. If you want to, if you want to go buy some metal, you are welcome to, you have time for you to do another billet in whatever metal you choose. And at the time I was not on a terribly high budget and I had just spent an awful lot of money getting to this class the hotels, the materials, all the things. Um, and I bought myself enough red, yellow, red and yellow gold. And so it was 14 karat red, 18 karat yellow and sterling, which was a good combo for color and for, for what works well with Mokume. 
Um, and I had bought enough to get a billet that was less than the size of a Lego. <laughs> and it had maxed me. Like, it was like, you know, I'm not sure I need to pay rent on time, kind of maxing <laughs> at the time. Um, and I put it through its steps. I did all the, the hours of scrubbing that you have to do that seems to never end. And I packaged it tightly. And I put it in the, the you, when you're doing their technique, you're putting it in a bundle of uh, charcoal and a wrapper. I promise I'm getting to your, to your question, Wendy, about stretching your boundaries. <laughs> um, and so I put that bundle together and I think there was a, so what I realized we, we had to put it in the kiln to be fired for a certain period of time. And that was what does the first stage of fusing the layers together. But there are so many things that can go wrong with it. And I got, I had it in the kiln, like I just put it in the kiln and I sat back at my bench to do something else. And I leapt up because I had been reading my directions over again after I put it in and realized I had missed a critical step. I can't remember whether it was something about how you compress it or the way that you put the charcoal in, whatever it was. I was like, oh my God, my gold is going to melt into a blob and I will lose all that money. And it was a turning point for me because I realized I, I managed to get it out in time and I did in fact bond it and I got four or five nice rings out of like I was able to stretch that Lego man into a few different rings by the time I was done um but I realized when I was traveling home I was like huh you know what it's just metal gold is not scary if you think of it as just metal we're not losing it at the worst, we send it back to the refiner and they separate it out and we lose tiny amounts of it or we get the cash value of 90% of it instead of all of it. But that that was a turning point for me where I stopped like hoarding little scraps of gold when I could get them and decided to actively try working with gold. For me, that was one of those stretches of, I have to push beyond the scare point and do it anyhow. Um, others of those kinds of things on the design are scale. If you've only worked small scale, what's the biggest piece that you can make while still challenging yourself to keep it wearable? If you've only worked, if you only tend to work in black and white, what happens when you introduce color? If you've only worked in color, what happens when you go strictly black and white? If you have only worked in textured material, what happens if you have to polish it to a high polish? <sighs> um, but, you know, so it's finding the things that make you uncomfortable and pushing your design in those directions. And it's it's a little bit like a rubber band. You have to get to a point in order to spring back to your comfort zone. But your comfort zone will have stretched a step or two further than you did before you stretched. Right? Is that making any sense, Wendy, in answer to your question? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. It really does. Yeah. It really and does. that's part of why it kind of needs to be a class where people can ask questions because what a lot of what I do is I have people look at each other's in flight exercise, whatever that exercise might be, and go, Have you considered? Not why don't you? Not you should. You should, you should is a word, a phrase that I grew up with, and I'm trying like hell to break it from my own communication. There should not be, I said, I'm using it now, there should not be ideally artists or, or friends or family telling you, you should, you ought to. It should be a, an open questioning of have you considered or what if? And that's where the creative process goes is the what ifs instead of here's what you got to do, Right. So the people that make those kinds of big strides are people who ignore the you should or this is the way it's done. And they're the people who go, I want to try it anyhow. I want to try mixing materials that nobody mixes before. I want to try stretching the bounds. John actually talks about some of the ways in which his approach to having been educated sort of made it so that he did things because he didn't know you weren't supposed to be able to. Right. So he didn't have a lot of formal training. A lot of it was self-learned or self-researched or self-attempted. And and so he didn't know that he was doing something that other jewelers would go, 
no, you did it. And he just did it. Right. And so that's part of the boundary expanding that we all need to do is try it anyhow and don't question. And the, and the, the, the workshop works well when we have a cohort of people like looking at something non-judgmentally and saying, what if you do X? What if you, instead of um, just making a square on that, what if you give yourself, how would you go about adding negative space to this? How would you go about adding height to this? What about incorporating other materials? Uh, and and those are some of the things that I try to get you to th your, sort of open your brain to in the design workshop. That was a long ramble for that one. <laughs> Just because we got <laughs> thank you so cool, much, Rachel. Help. Sure, <laughs> but you know what, Rachel? A lot of times, it has a lot to do with going back to your initial response about spending the money on the gold, right? Like you have maxed out, and you've already taken this class, and you know sometimes you don't want to take the risk because you want to get something out of it. Yeah. And if it costs you a lot of money, you want something out of it. Yes. I I I have a little bit harder time connecting. I personally don't do super well in classes that have set projects. I'm much, much happier in techniques based where I can jam out in my corner and figure out how that technique will incorporate into my own practice. I completely understand that people want an end product. Um, and I try to make sure that I articulate in whenever I'm teaching, whether it's going to be a class that you should expect that kind of outcome or you shouldn't. Um, so it's why part of my descriptions in the classes always says a student might expect to make X or Y or may expect to come away with samples of the following um, instead of I'm promising that you're going to have a finished piece of jewelry that you're going to wear to the, your prom. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I so mean it, yeah. I mean, that's, I don't expect to, like, when I did take your class, I wasn't yep. expecting to finish a piece. And when I did, I was, like, so proud of myself. But once again, going back to, like, you know, you're hesitant if you're using gold because the gold's going to be, like, was this going to be $300 that I just screwed up, you know, or something like that. Versus if I did copper, it wouldn't wouldn't be such a big deal. But then again, it's a whole nother ball game because of the way it's, it solders, yes. the way you yeah. connect it, the way you blend it. So yeah. I, I just think a lot of times it has to do with where you're at financially a lot of times Absolutely. and as an artist. And Absolutely. as an artist. I did not mean to imply that you guys should all run out and start working with gold. I'm still in my early stages of working with gold personally. Um, no, I was using that as an example of the fear of the money made me think if I do this wrong, I will have wrecked it. Because literally the step that I missed was one that would have resulted in me having a blob of all the metals melted together rather than the layering. So it would have been useless to me for Mokume. That was my my point in that. It was, I had I had been so running up against the, oh my God, I can't work with gold because it's so expensive. I had to change my brain from using that as an excuse to going, mm -hmm. I'm never going to be safe using gold. I'm never going to not melt gold if I don't actually start working with the material more. For yeah. you, it, it doesn't have to be about dollars. It could be about a technique or a tool that you're scared to use, right? Yeah. If, yeah. if you're avoiding using a polisher or you're avoiding using a larger torch or you're avoiding trying casting or, or any number of things... Find your nervous places and go to them and inspect them kindly. Because fear is good. It keeps us from hurting ourselves, mostly, except when you drop things on our toes. Um, and uh, But it also can, can stop your, it can stifle your creativity. And that's what I'm looking for you to push is when I feel nervous about something, think about why and think mm -hmm. about is it a discomfort? Is it a legitimate, I don't have the skills and therefore I might need to go learn them from someone to be safe doing it? Also a good way to expand your, your design idea. Um, is it that I think I'm stealing the idea from somebody else? Okay, so steal, but don't sell. You know, use it as a learning exercise rather than a finishing exercise. Um, or 
use it until you've learned how you make that technique your own. So you're not stealing from somebody. Um, yeah, it's just sort of being, embracing our boundaries and chewing them out of the way rather than assuming we can't get past them. That's what, that's what I try to get people to think about in their design methodology. It's one of the reasons that one of my, the, the necklace that I made in one of the, um, in the last bezel setting class was one that you guys, the students that were on that class said, Hey, can you show us how to do X with that? How about pushing this? And I had to keep rethinking the design to take in these new elements. Um, it actually, I'm going to, we can still go back to some of the other images I've pulled, but it leads me to what happens after the Cogswell project, because you guys have been asking me about that. Um, and the one, one of the thoughts that I have so far that appeals to me greatly, if you think it would appeal to you all or to any of you, um, is I have on any given point in time, I will often have 10, 20, 50 is my max that I allow myself half finished projects. And usually they have hit a wall for a reason. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I was thinking of doing, um, it would be moving down to once a month, whatever I do is going to be at, at most once a month, um, is taking a project out of that bin and talking through what it is in its current state, where I got stuck, and then on screen working past it to something else either deciding that I was going to scrap it entirely, repurposing pieces into a new design, um, sort of working through the challenges of what where we get stuck or where I get stuck anyway. Is that kind of thing of interest to folks? I realize I haven't so, seen your faces in a while. It is to me. Yeah, yeah. it is to me, absolutely. Um, just because yes. I learned some important aspect I set the piece aside saying to myself, sometime I'd really like to jump from this to making a finished piece and I have a pile. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because yeah, that's that would... my years of taking classes and, you know, acquiring whether it's enameling or whatever the subject matter was, you know. Yeah. It's that's what I was going to say. You only you have play along at home. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Wendy. I said, that's what I was going to say. You only have 50 So, so we have 50 I, unfinished projects. <laughs> I, I only have, so that what I've done, it, um, it's a serious number for me. So um, it's a discipline. It's a, it's a discipline and it happens about once every year and a half that I get to that many sitting projects. And it's usually representative of interruption in my normal practice. I'm getting less uh, extreme as the as I have my own space in my, it was worse when I was doing things at somebody else's studio. Um, and so, yeah, my cap is if I'm nearing 50, I need to lay them out and either discard some of them or finish some of them. And what's yeah. interesting for me is a couple of my recent collections have come from that reconfiguring or come from the readdressing of pieces. Um, so the, my latest collection is the Cirque collection, which is a series of, um, of hanging, they, they, I call it Cirque because they look like little trapezes to me that are layered, hammer textured and have rose cut stones set in gold on the sterling trapezes. And the centerpiece for it was a one-off. I found a really beautiful rainbow array of rose cut stones. Um, and I started it and I broke the main giant tanzanite as I was setting it and I put it aside and I was like I don't know what I'm going to do in replace of that because it was the center stone and then I took it out a little bit later and I played around with it more and I'd found a sort of replacement I wasn't happy with I played with it some more I may have even expanded it put it aside it literally took me a year and a half to finish it and by that time I was like I don't, I don't care as much about this as when I first started mm -hmm. design and it just became a one-off and I brought it to a show and it grabbed people. It just, people were like, I, that's amazing. That's amazing. It was a centerpiece necklace. Um, and so I went back to it and I said, well, okay. So I love the texture. I love the stones. I love the gold and silver combination. Why didn't I want to do more with this? What am I missing? And how would I take it back down from centerpiece to a collection? And a lot of my collections start that way. I create a piece of 
nobody's going to buy this in a million years, epic size and scale. Um, and then I go, okay, now how do I make the affordable versions of this for my customer base? And I work back to the earrings and the rings and the bracelets and things like that. Um, and so that's hidden in the 50. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff where I'm going, I, I, why did I pick this stone? Did I buy this stone? Why am I using these shapes? What? No. And they'll get taken apart for, for parts. Um, and some of it, I hit a technique or a, or a my skill level, I was trying to do something and ugh, it, it splashed hard. Um, and so I either have to decide that I like the design enough to now try it again with more expanded skills. Um, I try not to keep those designs for more than a couple of years, even if I trim it back down. But if I've hung on to it for a couple of years and it's made it past the culling of multiple times, then there's probably something to the design that I still want to work on. So, um, so again, does anybody have other pieces? I've, I've got a bunch more images, but did anybody have any pieces that they brought to the table that they really wanted to talk about? How is the stone set? Well, Rachel, could we back up to that one that you had attention set you were about to talk about? Sure. That was so cool. I liked that. Which one? Oh, that this one. Yep. Yeah. So I have no idea if this is a hollow form. If this is a solid form, either one would work. It is barely hanging on with that tension set, but man, it's a great example of architectural tension setting, right? I think this would probably do well as a hollow form with a heavy plate here and here that your stone is set into because the hollow form will hold the tension. Structurally, it's a very sound object. Um, but man, aren't those lines clean? That's just Beautiful. every angle yeah. perfection. Wish I knew who did this because I suspect there's another set in these. Um, here's another really cool setting. This is just an upside down mm -hmm. uh, bezel set as far as I can tell, but I liked the movement in the piece. Do you think it was formed? I mean, it looks like it was. This? Uh, yeah. Possibly. It could have been wax carved and cast. Uh, yeah. Because um, it's got a lot of the cutaway that's implicit in trying to keep a lightweight casting. Right. Um, and it looks then repeatable if it's done in wax. Or, uh, you know, that's another thing. You could fabricate the first one and then make a mold and, and work from, from the mold of your hand fabricated piece if you're doing a production line off of it. This one, I got it because it's got those double bullets and it's got oh, I love it. possibly faux flush setting, possibly actual flush setting. It's very, very thin wow. material. Um, but I am not entirely sure how they got to this to hold these in places. I don't know if that's just enough material and the curve of the bullet or if there's some cutaway. Um, you remember John showed us that we can put a wire. Uh, and carve a line around the stone so that it's when we're closing it down, that wire helps it compress around the stone. I don't know how they set that. Kent Reibel, who also teaches granulation wow. in particular, but if you haven't looked at Kent's work, there's a couple pieces I'm showing here because man, he knows how to set some stones. Um, this is tension set between the two stones. It, it is for a, uh, a, a, he did it as a, a piece for a collection, for a gallery exhibit called Tensions. Um, and man. So, so he took a pearl and then did everything on it, right? So I imagine, but I'm only really wildly speculating that he set this whole thing and it may be two half pearls and not a whole pearl. Oh, that's a thought. Um, possibly. Or he built it in such a way that he's got some kind of run through the pearl from this piece. And then this is probably a drill through because he needs the strength, the support of it. So there's probably a fairly consequential rod running through. And then it's just an intriguing use of, you know, setting the ends of the stone. I can't tell whether that's the culette or whether it's a bullet cut into what is probably platinum or white gold. 
Um, but yeah, so these are probably all made as components and then collectively put together. But I'm I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if this spins, knowing Kent. Um, and he teaches out of Seattle area, but he also wow. does virtual classes and he has recorded classes too. <laughs> this is what he's pretty famous for, is these this castles is in the just, sky. Just out there. His stuff is so out there. Yeah. It's just... I wonder how many hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't years. know. I don't know. He <laughs> he does. I I think he does stone cutting for himself at times, but he also mm -hmm. does a lot of sourcing of it. Um, he gave a speech to a, a talk to our our guild down here uh, about a year and a half ago, and he talked about how he gets these collections of stones together. But yeah, man, the number of different kinds of settings that go into one of his pieces are kind of off the hook. It's like sci-fi, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 This one I love because some basic settings, again, are bullet setting or traditional tab setting. But look at the movement. I love that. Yeah. These will swing back and forth. Super fun. I love that shape. Right? right. I have a bunch, but I'm too scared to do anything with them. <laughs> they're, they're a pain to set, as we found during the sessions that we did bullet settings. I still have a couple that I don't feel happy with how they set. Um, but yeah, uh, but I just really like that they've taken the tube action to give some movement to a ring that's going to be on your hand because that is an eye catcher no matter how you look at it. And it. I can't tell if there's little stones set up top or not. It looks like maybe. Yeah. It looks, it looks like, like there is there on the left yeah. side there. These I think they're I think it's just tube heavy wall tubing for oh, the okay. impact sort of industrial look industrial steampunk future all at once. Um, I like the combo. tongue shape. Yeah. Oh, is this, you think this is a tongue shape? I think No, I said, uh, besides it. those, I really enjoy the tongue shape. Yeah, not um, a lot of people cutting them these days. I think you sort of have to. Yeah, they really them. look nice. Mm -hmm. um, this one's cool. Uh, uh, it's called pretty. Revolver, I think. Uh, I think these are all <laughs> locked in, but I'm not positive. I suspect the whole barrel spins. I don't know whether these move left, right, or whether they're just a really, really close flush setting. Um, but it's a neat use of the inset stones. And it might, if it spins, it's a good fidget ring for somebody with a lot more money than me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine what the price of that would be. Tension setting. Isn't that killer? Yes. Yeah. Right. So this one requires the tension be built into the main frame. And then I think it's hollow form segments mm -hmm. and wow. then cut, in, cut into the hollow forms to create that. Just amazing. So and somehow the stones are put in at the end. They have wow. to be, I think. Well, you know, I don't I say that, but I suspect they have to be um, because they. I don't I think this is probably a peridot and that wouldn't take the heat citrine, you know, unless they are. Uh, man manufactured stones I could it could be um I don't know the order in which I would construct this I think uh it depends on the materials if these are platinum I can't tell what that is two five eight two five six I can't tell that might be a platinum um if they're platinum or white gold then you could construct all the segments separately put them in their frame or put the frame on them. It looks like maybe there's some drill points where this passes through to the other side. Like this is resting on here. I don't think it's slotted all the way through. Um, I would build this frame, build these pieces as separate units, get them all polished up and happy, position them, probably doing a piece at a time. So I'd put one, two in, get my cut in for the stone so I'm locked in put the next one in, get my cut in. It's the last one that I don't know how you really get it in there. That's, that's a surprise to me, but I, I don't know. I I'm completely speculating on the order of operations on this piece. Why? Yeah. I think that was the last one I grabbed for you guys. So we've that looked at great, a lot of Rachel. settings. Yeah. That Take was again? fun. That was a really was great good. Anybody have pieces that they brought that they want to either either actual pieces or photographs that you wanted to show? Okay, well we can always yeah I do, I do I do I do okay 
spotlight I you. Have, um, oh, this light is too strong. I have a dilemma how to hang this thingies that I really like. Yeah. Yep. So it's not hanging the way you like. It's it's tipping over. Mm, yeah, this is tipping over. See. So the the challenge on the card cut, which by the way, congratulations on doing a really lovely card cut, um, is that it is overweighted to the top of its piece. Um, so did you put holes in more than one point? More than yeah, one point? Yeah, that was for fun. Yeah. Sonia, but your fun may have saved you. The the point, Sorry? the thing that's gonna keep that hanging straight to you is if you put your chain into two corners of it instead of out of a center centerpiece no i tried it oh i see so one chain to one side and the other yep. one yeah giving yourself a v down to two of the points oh would, I would see. make it not flip because it would have two poles on the center of gravity ah okay you have I... jump rings that you can just connect it with yeah that's a good idea but you know i came to this uh, holy things or making the little holes just for fun it's beautiful can you see well, or do I have to bring it? Yeah, no, it's a lovely. You can put your hand behind it, and we'll be able to see the holes better behind it. Yeah, there we go. Oh, the other yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> that impressed. I like the new short haircut, though. I also haven't seen you in a long time. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are a great yeah. addition. And I what made... great clean lines you got on it. Uh, so that was one, and yep. I, know, I made another one. Nice. But... You know what was a pain on this one? Do you see hmm. that? The little tiny thing? Yeah, the extra tab looks that you like had to cut a, out. Like yeah. a tongue. Do you see yeah. how the difference? Yeah. How one looks one size, the other one looks the other size? Yep. That yeah, was he makes it so easy looking in his drawings, doesn't he? That you'll just yeah. slice the tiniest, like, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I re I don't know. I, I love this this setting. It's just, it's just so fun. Yeah. And I hope that you'll expand. That's that's a good area for you to stretch. What are the yeah. challenges you hit if you have to do a three-legged, you know, three slots, so you get six legs? Yeah, then I'm you gonna have to get your cut points angled differently, and you have to put the slots with different cuts to you them. You highlight yourself. I can. Oh, sure. Sorry, I'm waving my hands at you, aren't I? Uh, replace spotlight. So yeah. if you go with three. So, you know, three three flat pieces, your slots have to be cut and filed at the angles that will let them all slot together. It's a lot trickier. I would model that in cardboard before you do your first more than two flat surfaces, you know, more than four legs. Um, but there's a lot that you can play around with on that. Yeah. And and there was just, you know, his book, I don't know about well, if you encountered it, but I had to read like three times the same page and then one word was like below and once i went below okay now i know what was i doing wrong yeah this book is a little are you reading the electronic version of it no no i have the this one Oh, the layout. So there's a couple spots where it goes, it wraps around beyond the image that he's got with it and things like that. Yeah, it gets a little tricky. Yeah. So I got to tell you guys that this series of activities that we've done has been so, uh, so much of an education for me too, because I was looking, I've never looked at it as a textbook. I've only looked at it as a reference book previously. So the amount of yellow highlighting and underlining and arrows and stars and stuff in my copy now is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, so I have two copies of his book. I have the copy I got originally, which I think he autographed for me in one class. I'm, I'm not usually an autograph junkie, but I think I couldn't say no to a John autograph. Um, and then this copy that I got just for this project, because I knew I was going to be making notes about where I saw problems with it and so on. I encourage you guys marking the heck out of your books. I've got post-it notes. I've got marks and measures and, and extra corrections and all those things. It's why I was giving you so many, hey, I found a, a, a bug in the writing here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Stickers so it's all been a really over. cool exercise for me. I've learned a lot by trying to get in John's head with what he wrote for us a little bit more than just the in-person class stuff that I've taken.
Um, any other things that people, oh, Sonia, I didn't want to point out, I wanted to say that that's just one fix for your balance issue. Another fix would to be would be to solder on a some kind of larger, weightier bale off the back of it that counterbalances the weight that's at the top of the stone. The problem is your stone overweighs the legs of the piece in that because it's got so much height to the stone, I mean, to the to the setting, that's why you're fighting it. You're, you're on mute. You mean like uh, the, the weight where? Too much weight in the in the front? Or... No, so the nature of the setting, because it's so high. Right. The, the heavy, the fallover part is because your heavy weight of your stone is up above. So when it's resting on you, it constantly wants to tip forward. So the way to counter that is some kind of bale element that has weight pulling back towards your body off the back of the piece. And that helps counter the tr the stone trying to weigh itself and, forward. And, and I, I thought that this will be a good, uh, a good uh, oh, that's, ooh, bale. That's cool. It's, it's just that's a cool. folder, a folder, yeah. Thing, right? Yeah. Yep. And then how the heck do I attach it? That's the big solder. Solder? Sure. You, I mean, you got to take your stone out to do that. You're not putting your stone, taking your stone out. No, but how do you solder? Uh, you see? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. careful. <laughs> you can put some notches into your, uh, into your flat bars and make a little yeah. slot that your legs slot into. I'm just in love with this bale. I mean, that's I'm a fun trying, one. Trying, yeah. trying, how am I going to use it? How, and it's just a strip of, uh, wire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could you could even continue your drill pattern up the legs mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, so, I thought yeah. about that too. There's, you've got a lot of variety there. That the top yeah. of that spiral has sort of a feel of the, the pebble setting that we were looking at where they she'd built the, the wire curl uh, around yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the the, the, the the soldering is is you know, the slots and the soldering and then it gets a little Yeah, that's yeah. The, Congratulate. That's one of the harder settings in his book, in my opinion. The card setting is very finicky and very fiddly. So good job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do anything with mine. You I didn't get that oh, yet. It's still yet. pretty the way it looks. Let's see it. Where, did you show us? Oh, yeah. When when we did the chapter. Yeah. Do you, do you have it easily available so she can see it? Because I'm not sure she was. I don't remember. I don't think I saw it. Oh, let's see. Um, no, I don't think so. It is, after all, show and tell time now. <laughs> and I still haven't gotten a whole lot of photos from people about their stone setting, so I want pictures to send to John. Do you but want can I show what I did in your class? I'll send you a picture. You're welcome to show uh, whatever you want. Hang on a sec. Let me spotlight you. Oops. There we go. It just took its time to correct. So I took the hollow form class and um, I didn't know what I was doing, but this was my design. For some reason, is she very out of focus for everybody else or just me? I can see him well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Might be my cameras. Okay. Uh -huh. That's the shape. Like a torso. Is that a torso? Yeah, because my, my background is in sculpture, so I kind of wanted it to be sculpturally. And that's oh, nice. It. Oh, it came that's out nice. exactly oh. like her drawing. Yeah. I love it. It's yes, very it's nice. Cool. Very, very yeah. nice. There so the first one that I did, it was, uh, I made it too short. So then I did a little one. Oh. So now I have two. Very cool. That that one Very. in particular feels kind of Picasso face. -esque. Yes, action. Yes, and the nose and the chin and the yeah. hair and the eye. I Look love cheeks. Uh, I like <laughs> the first one. I like both of them. Yeah, that the smaller one looks like more comicky for me. For me, yeah. <laughs> when you look at it, yeah, but it's supposed to chin. be the head and the hand. Right, right, right. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what oh, you're saying. Okay. Cool. It looks more like a face. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
right. That's that was the did. class you taught you online or you went to no i just took it with rachel that was the my holoforms Form. class yeah oh, okay. the, the same one that i'll be teaching live in california in in march and wendy what? to go back to pushing yourself to limits this started as a hollow form, but I didn't solder it. I had a hard time soldering. And then Rachel told me what to do. And then I made it worse. And then I hammered the hell out of it. And it isn't, it's so cool in the hammered form. <laughs> like that is right. so much more interesting <laughs> than a basic hollow form to I me. I love it. <laughs> so and that's like, my ring. <laughs> so you find oh. like a salt and pepper diamond that you like and set it right in between that crevice that you made <laughs> like you do that even by itself as is it's beautiful but you could do so much with that series you could put resin fill in the top there's well, all resin kinds fill of would be nice yeah well yeah, i feel like it now i feel like it does need something in, um, in the inside or even just try blackening it like play with the variation so my point to you on this one when i sent you the email when you were, were, were despairing is this is where your creativity gets really interesting. Like that's not something you see every day. A lot of people make a basic hollow form box ring and you were doing that because it was the exercise that would get you the understanding of it. But that, right. if you do that with intent, instead of because it's your last resort, which you kind of did because you took a hammer to it on purpose, <laughs> there's there's so many interesting things you know what happens like when you maybe take kumbu? Yeah, yeah. And some, I mean, that's why I embrace texture. Is that I know that I'm never going to get clean polish. But think about it. You put like kumbu gold in the inset that you've hammered in, and polish it. Uh, you know, polish around it, and get the gold all sparkly, and then blacken around that. Like what? There's so many variations that can elevate. That'd be cool. That basic mm -hmm. concept that you came up with out of frustration, right? Yeah. I guess. I mean, I haven't done anything to it. Other, I basically um, just a brass thing. That's it. Brush. Yeah. I haven't patina it or anything. But it's interesting even as it is. You don't have to do more to it. That's my point. But you could <laughs> if you wanted to riff a collection. Now you know your technique is build the hollow form, destroy yes. the hollow form. <laughs> and, and it becomes something unusual that's that empowering <laughs> yeah i was I, I i i thought i slept with rachel <laughs> like she's telling me to do this i know i'm gonna screw up the ring i just know i'm gonna screw up the ring and of course i made a hole and then i thought nah i'm just gonna keep on soldering and solder i solder it for six times just to try to see if i could fix it so, and that's what I want you to do is push the bounds. I got to tell you, so you're, you're, you're worried about one ring. I'm getting my scrap no. pile ready to go to refinery. There are easily four or five fully done hollow form rings that are, that weren't acceptable to me because I found that kind of crevice, that kind of cracking at the end and I okay. couldn't, couldn't bear with it. And I, it was too far gone for me to repair. So that's, I, you know, I'm making probably a hundred to 150 hollow forms a year minimum and three or four of them are going to go in the scrap pile no matter what I do maybe more mm -hmm. depends on how architecturally challenging I'm making them my next my next hollow form thing that I'm trying is going to be inverted pyramids but I'm not there yet I'm still working on the architecture mm. what else we got anything you want to show off gang I have you're talking about pressure or whatever. Yeah. I did this ring in um what's his name? Uh Mike uh the boy, the nephew of my Alex. 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 Yeah, Ooh. okay. So I did it really mm. nice, blah blah blah. And then I showed it to my mother in law. And she said, make me one. And <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, Sonia, <laughs> mine's still sitting there. So you've done a great job. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to. I think the I I think the bezel is too tight, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. And then uh, the ring is coming along. So, but I'm never gonna do a commission or say to somebody, "Okay, I'll make it for you." No way. 
Again, and commissions for relatives are the hardest of all, or relatives or close friends. Yeah, I've never broken more stones than when I'm doing something for a dear friend. Yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah no, no, no. And then she said, but I'll pay you for it. I, I said, okay, okay. I didn't want to. Oh, my God. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to see her until November. So. Oh, good, good. Pressure. <laughs> you have time. <laughs> you can do a whole series by then. Yeah. I hope so. Yep. <laughs> All right, gang, anything else? We got any other? Oh, I got to tell you guys about the schedule from here on out. Let me get back to my notes. But uh, anything else folks want to catch up on or show off? Mm -mm. Okay, we are taking a whole month off. So there will not be a June 21st or a July 5th session. We'll restart July 19th, which is the third uh, Wednesday of July. And that will become the day that I do the monthlies from there on out. Okay. And what I'm going to start with is we're going to, we're going to go into the redo and finishing sessions. So I've got the Roman setting um, on my list that I know I'm going to want to work on. The dreaded emerald cut as both a step bezel and a basket setting. I, I got a basket setting, but I, I'll do that one again because emerald cuts are that hard that they're worth doing over. If I can find a freaking triangle, I just have not been able to get a good triangle stone since I started looking for one, then I'll do a triangle basket setting. I may have one. Triangle? Oh, yeah? You mean triangle? I may have an opal one. Not an opal. Oh, I'm not uh, doing it with an opal. Onyx. <laughs> you no, can onyx. do yours with the opal. You mean like, like no, this? No, no, no. Like an actual triangle. Not a trillion, but an actual triangle is what I'm looking for. Could be faceted, could be uh, tabbed, um, like but it's pyramid. just one that I... Pardon? Like a pyramid. No, no, no. Like a, a, tr a triangular stone instead of a trillion. Not a curved triangle. This? Nope. I'm looking for an actual triangular shape, although that's a cool stone. <laughs> this was uh, um, Carmen. Yes, like Carmen has. Let's see. Let oh. me see, Carmen. There we go. A triangular oh. tab or faceted stone. I have one. I have one. Yeah. Um, so I haven't been able to find. I only have a couple, and and the ones that I've got are. Could Carmen stuff. show that again? Because we didn't. I, it didn't show on her. Carmen, can you show that again? And oh, you want me to spotlight her? Yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. So oh, there you either go. Okay. either a cab like that or a faceted of the same shape. Okay. Is that a glass piece, Carmen? Onyx. Oh, you, that's a high polish for an onyx. Nice. I got um, Rachel, would you like me to send you one? Them. I would consider that. I, I want to do a little more. Don't I do that? Then you'll the have something shows. to work with. And what are the parameters size-wise? I have also a look. Oh, yeah, you've got... So I'm looking for one that's truly pointed at the corners because it has a little more challenge for us for the setting. Um, and either faceted or cab with a little bit of a you know curve. I'd prefer one to a cab to the totally flat that... Uh, like yes. less than 20 or... Um, so what I'm going for is big enough that you guys can see it on screen. Um, so I've been okay. working in the sort of, you know, 15 to 20 range. Oh, wait, maybe I did find another triangle. I did find another triangle. I glued, oh, it, to my, I glued it to my board to remind me. So I have an itty bitty little triangle that I can use. Oh, that's dinky. <laughs> <laughs> I did find one. I, I thought I hadn't uncovered one. Um, but yeah, have, so. I can send okay. you because I have several. I have I like think I'll be okay. Six. If this works, I'll do the triangle over again with that. Um, and I then I also them. have trillions because you guys, we didn't find any trillion descriptions in John's book. So I'd like to do a step bezel and a basket setting for a trillion. I have more trillions than triangles. I have lots of trillions. That's one of my Good. favorite cuts of stone. So let's do a um, whole series on trillions. I have them. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> um, and then, oh, I did say I was going to try and do a trillion, uh, um, uh, I was going to see if I could manage a trillion, uh, tension set. So i got to put that on my list. Um, yeah. I'm going to try and do a faceted cut card setting because you guys had, when we were doing the cut cards. Oh, you guys yes, yes, I want, I want that. Okay. That one I'm going to find a good stone for because I need a big round that is a decent belly. On those, you don't want to have too chubby of a belly to the stone 
Um, you want a nice clean cut. Um, let's see, trillion set, uh, tension set, uh, trillion. Um, I, I'm also going to, you guys had also asked to see me do one of the more unusually cut faceted step bezels. Um, so I've got a couple that have like a curve on one side and angles on the other. Um, and so just some of the challenges you hit with a more abstract, but still faceted setting. Um, were there any others that you really wanted me to revisit um, and and reiterate some of the components that we discovered along the way? I don't, I'll um, have to think about the, which one was it. You'll have time to tell to me too. You don't have to give me. I'm not. I'm not locking us in. Those are just the ones that I know I want to do in the next couple once per month sessions. Um, right. And then after that, the the two ideas that I had for the what's after Cogswell is that um, revitalize, redesign, and repurpose exercise from the box of an unfinished projects, which is kind of like the land of misfit toys. Um, or the other idea that I've had is challenge projects in which... I love those challenges. <laughs> so the way that challenge projects idea would work is... Um, you guys present to me a theme or uh, a um, an, an effort that you want to see something designed around. Um, you know, it could be something somewhat technical, and I'll just tell you if it's not something that I feel I have the skills to do, but it could be something like, uh, I would like to know how you would go about designing a brooch with, you know, uh, a faceted such and such, or it could be, I would like to know how, I would like you to design something with the theme of uh, elephants on parade or whatever. And, and people can toss a bunch of ideas into the mix and I'll use that to riff off of on a completely new design. Um, I can't guarantee that that would be one done per month. It would be probably some process projects. Like I'd get a whole bunch of ideas in the hat and and pick one that grabs me and, and start on it and decide how long of a project it's going to be. For me, the hard part on that one will be that uh, the the stopping between months to not do work on whatever I've started, because um, if something excites me, I want to keep working on that project. So, uh, but either of those are interesting things that I'd be willing to do on a once a month Wednesday night basis. Um, so, uh, Rachel, on the July nineteenth, yep. Then are you going to present that board that we've been working on? You, can I'm hoping to. Yeah, I've got to get time okay. between now and then to get it all set up. But we want to finish the Roman setting and fill in some of these others. Um, at the very least, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I I may not commit to having the board fully looking organized and nice because I'd like to get the gaps filled um, yeah. and have a really complete board before I do the da 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 presentation. <laughs> um, but when we you do that, then what we can do few. is uh, pull things off the board and look at them up close with the zoom camera. And sort of look at the the path we've taken um, mm -hmm. to get here. So yeah, maybe maybe consider just doing a few at a time and not the whole board. Yeah, it's more that I really want the board to be able to show the whole progression through the book. So I I like to get it laid out. I just have um, some projects yeah, that are sort of scattered. Something, I'm looking for. Pardon? That, and that was something that you wanted to send to John. Yeah. Oh, the pictures of the whole board. Yeah, I definitely yeah. sent the pictures yeah. of the whole board. Yeah. Um, so among other things, I would like to get him a, just a note. And maybe since people are not having a whole lot of photographs, maybe what I'll ask you all to do is um, drop me a few lines in a note that I can send along in a card to him, um, just telling him what you've gotten out of his book. And Oh, that's easy. Yeah. Well, that'll, be in the, that'll be in the fall. Yeah. Um, I, the sooner that we can get it going, the better. I mean, I would like to have the board together to send him a picture of it, but, uh, yeah, probably by, you know, September ish, it'd be nice to try and have that, um, that I can send it off to him, give him a little pick me up. Okay. Um, you have enough photos for me. I have enough photos from you, unless you've had some really intriguing new projects and then you can send me one or two more photos. <laughs> <laughs> You could do a book with all the ones I sent you. I could fill yes. a whole book with what you gave me. Um, I think you actually, one day, one day that you were doing it, I think you managed to jam my email because 
it was so full <laughs> that I couldn't that I couldn't until I moved some of them out of the storage space. Um, but yeah, anybody else have thoughts, ideas, uh, preferences, either for that additional certainly study? gives us enough. Yeah, that's a, a list. lot. I am that's a lot. Yeah. I really okay. enjoyed today. It was Good. great. Yeah. I did Thank too. you so much. Sure. Well, <laughs> if you find any other surprise images of jewelry, bring them to other sessions because I think I'll go a little more casual um, from here on out. Other than getting the Roman setting done, my other ones will sort of be, yeah, that's what I feel like working on in the list that we came up with today instead of being quite great. so formal about it. Um, and I, at some point, I'll have to figure out how to officially end the project. But I think that'll probably be the time that I feel that I've got enough of the settings filled in on the board. Um, I'm hoping to not do more than a couple more months, you know, a couple more sessions to get the majority of these. I've probably three or four will get us. Uh, the emerald cuts are still in there. Probably going to be four <laughs> sessions to get through the rest It'll of be these. another year. <laughs> no, I'm not looking for another year. <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> change so to something Rachel. else. <laughs> Bye, everybody. It's nice Goodbye, to all. You. Bye. all right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.